All right, so I think we're live now, but it's I not don't right. see. I'm looking. I'm trying to look at the. Uh, yeah. Me yes. Too. Is it? Yep. Can, we're live. Can you see it though? Because on my on my side, oh, that's right. Because there's a little delay. That's why I didn't see it ever. Yeah, there's a huge delay. All right. I not just a little. It's like a solid like. Yeah. Twenty thirty it's second right. delay. Yeah. Oh, gross ads. I know, right? Okay. Um, Let's get that shit. Let's get that trash. Getting everything set up, just double checking everything. You know how it is. You know how it be. Twenty four seven. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how it be, bro. I don't, I don't do this. You don't know how it be. <laughs> I don't know how it be. Wow. Not very base of you, bro. Like, no, no, that's kind of cringe, brother. Kind of cringe. Yeah. One so be it. Let me find my notes on the stream from last time, and I found it good. I really take a ton of notes. I, I stopped taking notes when we stopped the video because I got totally consumed by uh, what was his name? Uh, <clears throat> uh Poop. Sir Poopalot. Remember Sir Poopalot? No, Sir, it was Sir Poopalot. Sir Poopalot. Yeah, that was his name, Sir Poopalot. Like, you were like, <laughs> unsubscribed. Goodbye. Yeah, I know that was so petty. <laughs> no, no one cares. Yeah. Uh, uh sorry. <laughs> You get so destroyed that you just couldn't get come back from it. I understand, though, you know? Yeah. But anyway, all right, well, uh, you um, ready to start watching this, this fascinating interview? I suppose, yeah, why not? Man? And uh, oh. let me just make sure that the stream sound is working. <laughs> okay, sounds like it's working. <laughs> Didn't get come back from it. I understand, though, you know? Anyway. anyway, let me just make sure right, you're well, you're uh, saying the right stuff. And you, um, am I getting you on this? Watching this, this I, awesome hopefully. interview. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. We hear you as well. All right, good to go. All that setup is good, and we can start watching this this fascinating film interview. All right, you ready, my brother in Christ? Absolutely. All right. With Shopify, you can quickly and easily build your own online store, manage your inventory, and accept payments from customers. Plus, Shopify offers a range of customizable themes and... There we go. Of course. Shopify. Let's go down that road for a moment. So, because you, you might... I just said Shopify. Gross. <laughs> I don't know much about Shopify. All I know is... Continue that... to play. Continue to oh. play. <laughs> you might ask yourself, well, why use the sacrificial language? And also, why do you need to make sacrifices at all? And the answer is... You're always going to make, be making sacrifices because if you do one thing instead of another, then you sacrifice all the other things you could have done. So there's exactly. no action whatsoever without sacrifice. Now, then you might ask, well, is there actually something in reality that's worth sacrificing for? And the answer is, well, first of all, you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Now, generally what, because no matter what you do, if you do something, you're sacrificing. Now, People might say, well, I want to be able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And so that's sort of the ultimate in subjectivity. And there's an impulsiveness and a, and a pandering to whim that's associated with that. But that's not really freedom. What that is is subjection to the rule by impulsive whims. Exactly. And that's what you see as characterizing children, right? It's like, yes, I get to yes, do what I yes. want right now. Right. So it, then right. you might say, well, well, why sacrifice that? And the answer is because it isn't a coherent or communal medium to long-term solution. The reason you sacrifice the whims of childhood, that polytheistic state of motivational possession that characterizes childhood, the reason you sacrifice that to an integrated maturity is because the integrated maturity, A, constitutes an identity that will protect you from anxiety and provide you with hope, but also unifies you across time and lays the preconditions for your social integration. And there's nothing about that that's arbitrary. And so the question isn't who is going to rule you. No, I want no one to rule me. How can I set my life up so no one can rule me? The question is, what is it that I'm going to work towards allowing to rule me? And it's either going to be my whims, which means I'm subject to them, or it's going to be some higher order state of integration that requires sacrifice. And then that ties into this whole hierarchical identity. You know, you sacrifice your whims to your partner. Mm -hmm. You and your partner sacrifice your whims 
to your children. Yes. Your family sacrifices its whims to the community and all of that. Now you want that to be done harmoniously and you want it to be done voluntarily. Autonomously, voluntarily, exactly. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 th- so, so we have to create that sense of identity and purpose that makes us voluntarily opt into that nested identity state, right? Yes, there is there is a sacrifice right. for a marriage. That's exactly right. There is a sacrifice to entering a marriage. It's a sacrifice worth making. There's a sacrifice to having children. That's a sacrifice worth making. There is a sacrifice to being a citizen of a nation. I'm not a global citizen, just a global citizen. I'm a citizen of a nation. There's a sacrifice yeah. worth making. We can make these sacrifices if we know what's worth sacrificing for. That's the missing, what I call in the conservative movement to borrow from David Hume. David Hume had this famous chapter in, in, uh, in sort of his, his uh, he was an empiricist, but one of the paradoxes in his theory of empiricism was what he called the missing shade of blue. He could say what the shade of blue was without having ever having seen it. That was a challenge to his theory of empiricism. Anyway, I borrow that. I call it the missing shade of red in the conservative movement is this idea of the revival of duty and embracing duty as a precondition for freedom, but it's duty that we actually autonomously opt into by way of our free choice and our free will. These things are not incompatible. They're not contradictory. They sound contradictory. No, not at all. They're, they're not. Deeply no, 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 they're not. Co- they're, they're, they're sort of mutually yeah. required. The other thing I was just going to say about kids, because because I think this is one where I wasn't sure if you were going to disagree with me on this, but actually having heard you, I suspect that you don't. I've gotten this actually a lot on the road. I was in Iowa and New Hampshire last week. I do draw a distinction between this idea of freedom and autonomy amongst adults versus in children. So, you know, one of the things that I've said that rankles, I think a lot of the, you know, libertarian leading, you know, conservatives or whatever, and I used to call myself a libertarian for a bunch of reasons I'm not anymore. But, you know, is this idea that children are different than adults, okay? And so, so that period you talked about between 16 and 21, I mean, let's, I'll just even take the, the easier end of the spectrum, forget 21, just say 16. If you can't use an addictive cigarette by the age of 18 or, or drink a, an addictive sip of alcohol by the age of 21, why is it that you're allowed to use an addictive social media product as a preteen either? I mean, that at the very least is an inconsistency in the way we treat this. Now, I, te- I, I fully agree with you that all else equal, the path to getting to this ideal, the structure of ideal that we discussed before ought to be a path that does not involve coercion or impinging on free will. It is, uh, you, you phrased it very politely, it would be suboptimal, I believe is the word you used. Right. I think that that is the most great yeah, way a little of, bit, though. of putting that. I, th- I yeah, think it should it, be avoided, is, is the way I would say it. No, no, no I said you have to impede on that like a, li- oh, a little bit. It's not, you have to pee a little but I don't apply that. It's because like, I need a little, I, I put a note down. Children, because none of us believe that children that, actually, uh, you know, children that, um, actually, should be true. If you want to have the safety to actually express freedom, then that does require sacrificing that fringe form of freedom. I buy into this. I buy into this. You have to. There's no. Yeah, yeah there's exact complete freedom. Yeah, yeah. There's no alternative to that. Experience of freedom, but the path to getting there can't involve coercion. I'm with you all the way. So, so in the Exodus story, when um, God charges Moses with standing up to the Pharaoh. He tells Moses to tell, he tells Moses to tell the Pharaoh something very specific and he has him repeat it 10 times in case you didn't notice, right? It's repeated 10 times in the story, nine or 10 times. He tells Moses to let my people go, which is of course a very famous phrase, but that's not the phrase. Yeah. The phrase is let my people go so that they may worship or celebrate me in the wilderness, in the desert. Mm. And so what it does is it sets up not freedom, but ordered freedom. Mm. Yeah. And so then you might ask yourself, well, what a really constitutes good point, actually. ordered freedom? Well, a game a really, is really ordered good point. freedom. Yeah. A voluntary game is I, I never thought about the full implications of that line in that it's not, but it's dependent it's on not on ultimate freedom. It's not right? Those are the rules of that game. And a game's a good freedom to do whatever you please. Voluntarily. Mm-hmm. And they want to it be is able to enjoy them. the freedom so to go and you worship your like, God if you or, a you know, expand it out to go with a game like live within another structured society. Culture, sure. Then people voluntarily hop aboard. Now, the free market response to the problem of the margins is to produce a plethora of games. And so that you might be a marg- you might be marginal in one game or almost all games, but there may be some game that you'll be central because of your temperamental advantages. And I think you can see that in the gay community, for example, mm-hmm. especially among yeah, the Yeah, I suppose Jack's lost kind of right, in a sense. The entertainment industry, especially on the 
on that on the more I mean, that's like an implied statement, but it's also like find what game within society. I mean, what do you define as right? That's a whole other job. What do you define as right or wrong? He's a loyal on the cultural transformation front. And so a free market solution to... Um, the problem of marginalization is something like the the offering of a true diversity. Mm. It's like, yeah, you're you're only five foot two, so you can't <laughs> play basketball, you know. But you might be a damn good jockey. Exactly. And if we have enough games, exactly, exactly Perfect. that, and then people can trade on their idiosyncrasies. Right. And you see, this is an argument that free market types haven't made to the diversity types. Well, it's like it's equality like, versus Well, the equity. reason you want a free market is to provide a diverse yeah, number that's... of games so the marginalized can find a center. Diversity so I'm approach I'm to diversity I'm itself, by right the way. And I think you see the same thing. I mean, so, so I've been trying. I don't know that I've succeeded over the last several years, but I've been trying to exactly preach that to the diversity crowd, where even if you think about institutional purpose, right? You were talking about at the level of individuals in the marginalized side, and, and so, so I agree with that. That's one form of diverse approaches to diversity. Here's a different approach to diverse approaches to diversity. Is diversity of institutional purpose, that even different companies, let's just take it in the realm of companies. That's the world I've lived in, right? Corporate America and capital markets, fine. Each company ought to have a unique purpose. And what is the problem with using a common three-letter acronym? It's funny how these things always come in three-letter acronyms, but from ESG to DEI to CSR to you know CCP, I joke around. WEF. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. CCP and WEF are some of the ones lurking behind the scenes. But the problem with these, you know, ESG or DEI three letter acronyms. CCP is pretty upfront. What are they you know? effectively yeah. saying? They're saying that no, 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 you can't have your own distinctive purpose. Everyone's purpose must be common to advance environmental, yeah. social, and governance goals, diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. That's a denial of diversity, right? It, it, it rejects it's a lurking tyranny. purpose. Exactly. It's, it's a facade. It's a, it's a really pro ideological facade, yeah. have that fall essentially. Out of the structure that you and I discussed, right? What is your yeah. institutional purpose? If you run an institution, you have one question. Why do we exist? Period. Have a good I answer think, to that question. I think that relates to art and then say as well. what type like, of diversity you espouse. Nowadays, like music, That's movies, really just in service of advancing that institutional purpose. Different it's types of institutions like should risky, want different kinds of and, like, diversity, and, and, right, and they should be. That, you know, but I think the purpose of a piece of art could be a political meaning. Could be, but it doesn't have to be. I'm a vegetarian. And okay. like you're trying to like I don't eat meat the because I believe it is it in, in my tradition like morally like, wrong what, to kill animals like a solely a for culinary or pleasure. Or there are conditions in which it would be fine to do it, but if it's just for my culinary pleasure, I'd rather not do it. I suppose. I mean, we I could respect other people's pause this and argue about that right now. But take the example of me working at a steakhouse. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would not make for a good employee at a steakhouse, even if I would deliver the ever prized form of diversity of thought. See, people sometimes are loose in terms of diversity of thought instead of diversity of appearance. Yeah, yeah, I'm in favor of diversity of thought over diversity of appearance too. But even diversity of thought is too low resolution. That's a diverse thought. But a steakhouse still shouldn't want to employ me because that's not the kind of diversity of thought you should want if your focus is on delivering excellent steak to a customer because the kind of diversity you want there should be in service of your purpose. Yes, Jack, so I have. It's actually pretty cool. Of the idea of it's very fascinating to me. Itself gives meaning yeah, I saw some of that to stuff. diversity itself. And I've been seeing a lot of it recently. It's very, very interesting. Context, little little terrifying. Very, it's very interesting. Diversity discussion that we've, we've a little spooky. But... There's a couple of places we can go with that. So one of the things you're pointing out, and it's in keeping with this Burkean notion of subsidiarity that has its origins in this Exodus narrative, by the way. When AI art's so, been around. There's going to be a variety like of institutions at each level of the hierarchy. Yeah, because he... There's a variety of forms yeah. of... I mean, he's a very biblically you know, going to be derived the person. The person. The woman is the primary like breadwinner, for mm -hmm. example. There's going to be some couples where the man is. And, I mean, I feel like most people fun. love AI art. You, I don't... you want the commonality of the coupling, but you want the diversity. Well, I mean, I love, but like they're either indifferent or they don't particularly care towards AI right. art. The same anyway, the level of that's family. not, there's going to be not some off topic. Families with 10 kids, there's going to be some gotta, families gotta... with one. There's going to be blended families. But that's that still circles oh, around the core of family. Yeah, so you have order, yeah, you have diversity at each of the levels of order, and that you also have the recognition that each of those levels has its own domain of uh, sacred responsibility. 
Now, one of the things I've noticed, you could try this out for yourself if you're curious about it, but you know, I've gone to 400 cities in the last four years lecturing about the sorts of things that we're talking about today. And there's one point I make that always brings the audience, no matter where it is, to a dead silence, like absolutely pin drop dead silence. And here's the argument. So you need a sustaining meaning in your life. Now, what is sustaining me? That's not a good point. It Jack means it will you sustain correct, you say. through catastrophe. Yeah, yeah. So it'll sustain you through pain and terror. Now, that can't be happiness because happiness is absent in conditions of pain and terror. So it can't be that. So what is it? Well, I drew on my clinical experience to answer that question. Well, what do people have when things, when they're truly in the desert, when they're abandoned and lost and in pain? Well, they have the structure around them that they've made sacrifices to produce. They have their partner, they have their, you know, their, their wife or their husband, they have their children and their parents and their, and their siblings. Sustaining they That's have an their interesting friends, they have their point. community, they have this hierarchy of social Matthew structure tonight. around them that can sustain them if they made the proper sacrifices. And then the question is, well, what is the nature of the sacrifice that's necessary to make those bonds? And the answer is, well, that's the adoption of voluntary responsibility. Mm. And so once you know, and this is something conservatives haven't ever made explicit, the meaning that sustains you in tragedy is to be found through the voluntary adoption of responsibility. Oh. Hmm. And so you can tell young people that, that it's, you can tell young people that you say, they say, well, why should I grow up? I can just do whatever I want whenever I want. And that's especially true if they happen to be wealthy and privileged. And the answer is, well, if you expend all that capital on hedonism, as soon as the storms come, you're shipwrecked. Absolutely, there'll be nothing left of you because there's no hedonism in hell. And what you have there is whatever you've built responsibly. And there's meaning in that. And people understand that immediately. And it's part of this alternative vision to this fractured hedonism that everyone is celebrating now. Let me ask you a question about- All right, I think it's a good good point to talk a little bit about, just extrapolate what's been going on. Also, perfect place to pause, as you can see. Um, so, yes. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Some of the notes I brought up. So first of all, they're talking about duty. Something that's lost in the yeah. conservative movement today, duty and sacrifice, because I think a lot of, like, like he mentioned, the more libertarian conservatives, they, they kind of have this sort of laissez-faire approach to government where I think something that's lost in the conservative movement today and in the Republican Party is this idea that we all have a shared responsibility towards the success and survival of the state. Um, we all have and, – and we have to create that, that sort of will to accept that responsibility organically. It's hard to just say, okay, well, this is what we're going to care about, right? That's difficult to do. So we have to find a way to organically make that part of our zeitgeist, make that part of our culture, sort of mm -hmm. saying like f trying to find a way in which you organically create a culture. That's the thing. Culture essentially becomes organic movements towards certain like um, cer certain specific customs and values that we adopt in the society because otherwise you need laws to, to enforce those things. Right. But culture essentially is the idea of organic, like uh, allowing it to come about naturally. This is kind of what they're there. I think why I think they're um, talking about, like not trying to be too coercive, trying not to coerce this specific outcome that you want too much. That's through the creation of culture, because culture becomes the what dictates custom and value and right or wrong in the absence of law. And law is the coercive, non-organic, forceful creation of of trying to push society in a specific direction. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's pretty much what you brought up. I think, I think it's. I was just gonna wait for you to finish. Oh no, I was finished um, at that point. I'll bring up some more stuff in a bit. Do you have some thoughts on that? I, th I think. Uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward I what they're talking about. Point if but I think it's a really good. Uh, but I think it's a very notable thing to bring up. Sure. Politically. Yeah. In that there is no movement, you know, on the conservative side that goes back to the root of duty. Sure. And then, really, of a duty to something greater than yourself. Yeah, and, but, but it's like you said, though. You do need a certain a certain um, amount of order in this society. Like, it's order yes. freedom, is what you said. It's, you, it's required. 
Yeah. Uh, arguably, I'd say it's required of a society. Mm-hmm. And that's because and that's like, if there's no, if there is absolutely no order, mm-hmm. then anyone can do as they please. Right. I don't even know if I'd call that a society. And then if you have too much order, then uh, people just aren't going to have as much. Like you look at a communist state where you make like about the same money for yeah. the same work. You're not going to try hard to be a doctor if you're going to get paid the same amount as like, um, you know, a cash. Sheet. Yeah, the only way you will is if you're extremely, extremely. Uh, idealistic and yeah. ideologically driven or yeah. belief driven like right. it's the only people who can do it but most people aren't aren't that way yeah. and then a lot of those people will be jaded and their will or their their morals will break eventually right. and then you that's that's why they all end up as huge uh corrupt bureaucratic states right and then going off of that as well this is the reason why Jordan Peterson's, like, it's the Beyond Order tour, right? It's essentially reconciling order and chaos. Now, he uses Exodus a lot to, to sort yep. of talk about this. and you know we, More recently, he's used Exodus yeah, a lot. Yeah, recently. He, that's his thing right now. And we discussed it yesterday. It's basically, you know, it goes down to, well, the, 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 you know, the Israel, Israelites, the Jewish people, were so used to being under the Pharaoh's tyranny for so long that in the absence of a tyrant being out in the desert, you see— the pharaoh represents complete order, complete tyranny, right? And then the desert represents complete chaos. And Moses has to be the mediator to balance order and chaos. And he's eventually able to do this because at first the Jewish people want to make Moses their tyrant, Moses their pharaoh. Yep. But through because that is, you know, culturally, like we seek order. Yeah, well, I, I see this actually a really big thing is, is people, especially, yeah, but cultures that, that come from extremely, extremely rigid societies mm-hmm. will always seek order. Yeah, and that's why some countries have a hard time accepting democracy, uh, like the Middle East or Russia, you know, some parts of Asia. In a sense, yeah. yeah. I think it, it, it kind of, it's kind of tied into the culture at some point. But going off of that, Jethro was the one who helped. Um, obviously, we talked about this before, but just to like re-ha- re- re-talk about it, Jethro reconciled this by saying, all right, division of labor, one man in charge of mm-hmm. 10, 10 in charge of 100, you create social hierarchy, right? So that's good. Yeah, it's yeah. Creating the as order, we discussed yesterday. Yeah, but it's giving them enough chaos, you know, because you have each individual small, you know, smaller leaders to make a decision based on their constituents. And it's just, it's nice. It goes down the line. There's not one pure tyrannical thing. You have division of labor. That's a good thing, right? And one thing that I'd like Jordan Peterson to talk about more, I don't know if he has in his past podcast or whatever like i said his philosophical understandings are kind of limited and i don't like a lot of his takes so this could be why he hasn't mentioned it but like the you know the the sort of reconcilement of order and chaos is essentially the dionysian and the apollonians the apollonian is order the the apollonian virtues which come from the god apollo are essentially you know he was he, he, he it was it was more about a structured life almost stoic in some ways a stru- oh, so much so much surprised he hasn't mentioned something like that so right. he typically goes into those sorts of roots but yeah, but that's that's the Apollonian it's, side of the order, right? And then you have right. the Dionysian, which is chaos. Di- Dionysus was the god of you know wine and partying and and being tied to that animalistic roots. So I'm reading uh, Birth of Tragedy right now, which discusses mm-hmm. this um, concept. And he, you know, the satyr in Greek mythology represents the human. The, it represents the animalistic roots of humans because it's a ha- it's half goat half man and the satyr's kind of this big party animal and that and and they worship directly to Dionysus so the satyr right. sort of represents this very Dionysian you know animalistic humanoid type creature and ultimately what man is supposed to be is a balance between the Apollonian because ultimately being you know kind of having Apollonian um, virtues is, is very difficult for a human that might be something a god could do right but man is is the reconcilement of these two pools one pulling towards complete order one pulling towards complete chaos and it's all about finding that good middle ground that fosters organic uh creation that cre- that, that brings forth instruments of expansion that come about organically once you try to institutionalize things and you say this is how you're going to do it people aren't going to have as much of a incentive to be like okay well i'm going to put my mark if, 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 if someone tells you you know just straight up go go build a bridge you know well it's like Okay, I don't know anything about building bridges. I guess I'll build it. But then, if 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 you if you grew up in a society where architectural pursuits are are encouraged, you know, in a sort of you know more hands off way, then you might grow up to be an architect and you're going to build a pretty damn good bridge. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were going. I wasn't sure where we were going with that one, but 
but yes, okay. It makes sense um, in the end. Yeah, I think so. I think another um, really big thing, they only mentioned the term trade-off very briefly, but I think that concept is very important to understand when you're considering especially freedom in any society or any, any literally any legal proceeding or any anything is that there's always a trade-off in every single choice you make at every single second. There's a trade-off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to and, sacrifice a little bit of freedom for the betterment of the, of the entire collective group. Like, exactly. Like that, for example. That's another, that's a good example. Or, I mean, just... Taxes. Perhaps the, the classic, jury duty. Oh, jury duty. Okay, that's, yeah, there's one. Yeah, jury duty, taxes, um, military service. It's a it's a trade off you agree to make as a citizen. Um, I think country. trade duty sounds fun personally, but <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I always think, and then everyone like bitches and moans well, about people it. People are also stupid. So. <laughs> nah, that's a fair point. I'll, I mean, also most people have like have literally just don't care about law. Sure. At all. For them. I, I'd be down to do some jury duty. I'd be down to be in jury, jury duty, bro. But, they um, probably kicked me off. They probably think I'm too excited to be here. They'd be like, "No, yeah, you're out. We want guy, someone this miserable." Has, this guy has some interest in this case. Like, he's he's like, he's trying get to out of here. Get off by but yeah, no, I know. I, I get that, and, and I think. I'm sorry, hold on. Look at my notes. Sure. Well, um, what I wrote down relating to what you just mentioned is like that voluntary voluntary shared responsibility, which is culture essentially. Mm-hmm. We need yes. to have well, something that we all want to contribute to, but it's something that we share, and we voluntarily sacrifice a little bit of our freedom for the betterment of the collective group. What did Jack Slot say? Yes, and when Jordan puts an echo, the host understands he gives that way. And then Jordan <laughs> I, can I see it, and he grabs his ring. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck you mean. <laughs> Jack Laws, you're too smart for us. We just can't understand. He's next guy. level, man. Maybe, maybe he's, he's the AI. Based. Yeah, he's an AI. That's why he's the AI. He's the AI. follow with us, because he's an AI. Now, you're, be exposed. You're too basic, Jack you're too, basic. too based. Too knowledgeable. Too wise. But, um, but yeah. <clears throat> I think their discussion on the org, the purpose of organizations, and that organizations ought to have a purpose. Yeah. They shouldn't simply exist for the sake of existing. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think I think the more and more you focus on any organization, or rather, when the more and more an organization simply focuses on the sustainment of itself and its purpose is simply profit and making profit for the owners or shareholders, or I think that's what he wanted, though. I think he was essentially saying that corporations should just focus on that and shouldn't try to get into the realm of like social issues, like ESG. I feel like he was more like saying they shouldn't. Maybe, purpose. I think that's what he was talking about. Because essentially, I suppose that, that 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 is what he was saying. I I would say that while he's correct, like that also just sort of creates a humongous class of corporatists. It depends, though, know. right? Because don't you think it because that it you have to structure it very yeah, well, carefully. Don't you, don't you think it strengthens the corporatist if they are engaged more in the political? Because if they're just focusing on economics. And, and, and their own like shareholders' interest, then you know, um, if they just stay within that realm. Thing is, though, is that, is that, is that I would pretty easily argue that the poli- that politics, mm-hmm. because politics affects the economy and the economy affects politics, there's almost no means of removing the two from each other. Well, you can. It's just you could try and like keep money out of politics, right? That's that's possible. Well, also, it's it's a matter um, of who controls who. I think in, a, in, in but even if you're. I, Sure, but even if you're looking at what is in the benefit of the shareholders, well, if there's a law in place mm-hmm. that prevents this company from being able to maximize its profit for whatever reason, yeah, then, then the benefit of the shareholders is sure. to get rid of that law. Yeah, that's true if you look at like um, the military-industrial complex. like Obviously, they're going to lobby for military intervention because then they sell more tanks, more fighter jets, exactly. more small arms. But same with, like, I would say same with the pharmaceutical industry, same with pretty much every industry that yeah. has enough money to do so. Sure, but I think that, I mean, that that's a fair point, but it seems like the mo- more, because like currently, right, he's not criticizing just complete corporate interference in politics exactly like that's part of it but he seems to be focusing more on like what he calls the woke culture right so that's using social issues environmental issues to sort of screen what's going on behind the scenes like the whole occupy wall street thing right Mm -hmm. so i mean you're right 
everything you said is right, but I don't know if that's exactly what Vivek is currently criticizing right now. I think he's more criticizing what he, you know what he said ESG, right? So that's not including like the military industrial complex lobbying. Like look at look at like um, all the generals that like for example when the Marine Corps decided to to get rid of all their tanks, right? How many generals spoke out again against that, and how many of them did that because well. They were lobbyists for the military industrial complex that mm. tanks. So that that happens, right? That's that's a very real thing. But I just don't think that's exactly what he's currently emphasizing. It he's, he's focusing more on, just on when they system. hijack or utilize social movements. Wait, but see, even with the military industrial complex, you can kind of make the claim that they do because, like, I feel like the Ukrainian war has been really politicized. You know, like. It, it, I mean, which makes sense yeah it makes sense but like i don't know how it's not, i don't know how it's not going to be it's an event of politics yeah right? yeah sure but i'm saying that um like for example i i, I would i would make the argument that the sort of esg thing like using a social movement to justify um a certain thing in this case military intervention in ukraine is sort of like you remember when russia first invaded ukraine everybody had the ukrainian flags on their instagram and all that stuff I see people with that shit still. Sure, all the time. it was especially big, right? Right when that yeah, happened. it was like huge. You know, the whole ice stand with Ukraine thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Goofy as fuck, bro. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm getting at is the military industrial complex. They probably had a vested interest in making this a social encouraging issue. that. Yeah, and making yeah. A social issue encouraging it and making it a making it as popular as possible. Make it the exactly. current thing to yeah. support the Ukrainian war. Exactly, because like, what if we just said, and this is what I would say. So like. You know, in terms of the Ukrainian war, you know, if, if I was a straight, if I was the president and I was transparent, I'd probably just say something in the lines of, well, we are an imperial state. The United States, you know, despite being a democracy, we are an empire. And part of an, being an empire is protecting your interests globally, right? But if I just said that, is that going to appeal to the emotion of like social justice warriors? Well, obviously not, no. So instead, but, it's look how evil Russia is. Exactly. So it becomes a social issue. Look how bad Russia is. And support not, Ukraine, support Ukraine, you support Ukraine. Yeah, and I'm not even saying Russia is, I mean, Russia is bad. It's it's 100% true. But do you think that's the reason why? Are we really intervening because Russia is bad? Or are we intervening no, because we're no. protecting our global interests? And I agree, we should protect our global interests. But I'm always about transparency, personally. So it's yeah. like, but transparency doesn't work. in Because we're so used to being fed bullshit for so long that we're just going to, we're, we're, we're not even going to follow the transparent people. Like Vivek's being transparent. You see other politicians yeah. in the past be transparent. They never get anywhere because people don't want transparency. They really just want to be fed shit because it makes them more comfortable and you don't have to deal with the uncomfortable reality. Ooh, that's another... So, like... So, I'll, I'll let you finish first. I'll let you finish first. Yeah, I need sure. to gather this all up. Um, so, what I'm getting at, essentially, I'm just writing some notes down so I can pin... Uh, so I can timestamp this later. But, essentially, what I'm getting at is... Um, People don't want to deal with uncomfortable truth, truths. People don't want to deal with uncomfortable realities. We want to believe we're the good guy. We don't want to believe that we're just doing things out of self-interest. See, I don't think there's a problem in just saying straight up, we are an empire and we are defending our imperial ambitions in Ukraine. We are supporting a, a country that, that Look, can strengthen... The only bad just, thing, the only bad thing, mean, even... I, so I would argue strategically, the only bad thing about that mm -hmm. is that's really bad PR. That's but now, point, in Why? the culture we, we, of today, that's yes, really bad PR. That's what I'm and, at. and ergo, we're never going to fucking do that. Well, Even though that's exactly what we are and that's exactly what we're doing. Never going to do that. We're never going to come out and say yeah, we're within an empire. The of today. Within today's structure. Sure. Yeah. I'm saying today. I'm, yeah, I'm, not, yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about a potential future sure, sure, structure. Sure, I'm talking about right now. Yeah, but, but that's what I'm getting at, right? So that's the whole concept of the ESG, right? It's appealing to the emotion based on how the system is. Okay, based okay. on how society and culture is now. These companies, they understand how to push their agendas because they understand how people, uh, you know, how people's minds work. So it, they're not going to be like, and, and personally, I'd be a lot more willing to, to intervene places if we were just straight up and we're like, you know, like, why don't we appeal to the imperial identity, which is the United States of America? Be honest, yeah. That would be, yeah. Uh, that I could appreciate more because it's like, it's straight up, it's honest. But then when you try to conflate this as, oh, this is a fight for the future of democracy, like, come on, no, it's not. You were calling, oh, you were calling the Ukrainians Nazis five years ago. You remember that? Literally, just yeah. based upon our interests, we changed the whole narrative. Everyone was calling the Ukrainians Nazis four years ago. And, you know, there's Nazis everywhere. There's Nazis in Russia. There's Nazis in Ukraine. But now when the but now when the Russians call them Nazis and go to war with them, uh, then it's like no, no, no. And it's wrong. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying. But it's 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 really all about 
propaganda. Energy in Europe and testing our weapons. Yes. And control of Eastern Europe. That's really those and, those are the things it's about. And essentially defeating Russia's block. And I'm not even disagreeing with our exactly. intentions. I see both. I see the no, I, yes. I see the American reason for being involved, and I see the Russian reason. I don't. I don't criticize people that are protecting their own interests. I don't criticize us protecting our own interests. I don't criticize Russia protecting their own interests. I don't criticize Ukraine. Everyone's just doing everything for themselves, which is fine. That's what happens in geopolitical politics. What I don't like is when we have to create a culture where we have to lie about things to intervene. Like, why do we have to do that? You know what I mean? Yeah. If, I, if, it's, if it's within your sphere of influence, it's within your sphere of influence. If it's... If it is about securing your interest, mm -hmm. just be honest. That's what it's about. Don't don't fucking yeah. So so don't like, try and lie your way. Don't don't try and lie your way through it and talk about this. Yeah. All this is for Ukraine, not no. Not we don't bullshit. care. Like our our. If this was if this was happening on the other side of the world, we wouldn't give a fuck. Well, if we're, it was happening in a part of the world where where things didn't matter, like why didn't we intervene in Rwanda? We did not do shit yeah. during the Rwandan nope. genocide, where like no a reason. million, like a million um, specific uh, ethnic minorities were literally massacred. We did not do shit. So how come we didn't do shit there, where it would have been much cheaper to intervene in a small country like Rwanda? If we really just cared about the morality of these things, then we would have intervened in tons of other places. So I'm not saying that we're wrong for intervening in Ukraine. I'm saying that. There is no moral reason to do it. It's all about our self-interest, which is fine, but let's just be honest about it. We are there for ourselves, and that's okay, but we are there for ourselves. It's, there's no moral yeah. reason that we're there. Same with, you know, I think Afghanistan. Like, I'm not disagreeing with those wars necessarily. I mean, I, I would disagree with Iraq, but I'm not disagreeing <laughs> yeah. with maybe even Afghanistan. But I'm not saying, what I'm trying to get at is if we just justified those wars based on imperial um, ambitions, then I would be way more willing to support them than trying to lie over oh, nation building, oh, we're trying to promote democracy in these countries. No, we're not. We're protecting our imperial interests, and that's fine. But this, let's just admit it, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. Like, we should, as every nation should. I feel like at one point, perhaps, they did. But not anymore, not for like 100 years. Right. Easy. But we are an empire. We have an imperial duty to intervene in certain places. But I just don't like when it gets conflated as like a moral issue. Like it's just ridiculous. Well, another 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 thing is is that having some big facade of your purpose mm -hmm. gives you, I would say, it gives you a little more wiggle room to get away with some of the clandestine shit. Yes and no. That really empires do. Sometimes being more transparent, people are just going to accept the clandestine shit and they're not even going to ask questions. Sometimes I feel like if you're straight up about That's it, like, like think of it this way: look at like look at um like in World War Two, for example, right? Look, look at what they were doing. The Japanese and the Germans were committing mass atrocities, right? And, okay, so in the Germans' case, they did hide it from the public. So let's not use Germany as an example. Let's use Japan, right? Look at, the, look at, look at all the atrocities that the Japanese committed upon various Asian groups. Even, you know, that, that was like all, all those people um, that were engaging in these sort of acts – uh, they they knew exactly what what the quote unquote purpose of their war was, and it was the imperial ambitions of Japan. Now I'm sure they had a little bit of propaganda there, but ultimately they were straight, pretty straightforward. We're trying to expand the Japanese empire, and people still did all these things, all these clandestine things that they shouldn't have done, and they got away with it. You know what I mean? So sometimes it almost makes it easier because if you don't pretend to do something based on morality, then when you uh, when you interfere with morality and you do something evil. They're not going to question as much because it's like, okay, well, this never was about good or evil anyway. So why am I going to call? Why am I going to call out evil if there's was never? About good that's or true. Evil? But it also makes you less. <laughs> there's another. There's another side there's to that. Though. And, for sure. I'm not and saying it's, it's one-sided. Yeah, but so here's here's the thing, like with Japan, for example, and yeah. and in comparison then to now, like yeah. then while they were committing those atrocities, mm -hmm. yeah, the people around there knew. But the rest of the world had no fucking clue. Uh, no, they knew about the rape of Nanking. That was big news. Worldwide. No, I don't. Did they? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Let me look it up because I'm pretty sure. It was I don't a think major, so. I'm gonna look it up. I'm pretty sure it was a major, major thing because you have to re recognize that this 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 lasted six weeks. Like this was a long thing, and you know we had a lot of journalists in in uh, in Asia during that time. I'm gonna double check because I'm pretty sure this was a major. Major thing. I keep talking while I'm looking this up because I don't want to like well, hold off the conversation. But I think I think now, especially a good example might be the Vietnam War, right? Mm -hmm. We went in there, right, and that was probably the first 
televised war. Sure. I think it was, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, ever. Yeah. To have active streaming back to the public. And when that's that's where a shit ton of the outrage came from. Mm -hmm. It's because now we saw what the fuck we were doing. Right. And everyone was like, hold the fuck on. Mm -hmm. This is insane. Why are we doing it? Why are we even there? What's going on? Why are we, why are we doing this? Right. And now it's even crazier, right? Like, you could just go... It takes, it takes five minutes to find active, like, in the last couple months, combat footage from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And... Excuse me. That's where shit to me out. One second. I need, to check, I need to do an audio check really quick. We saw what the fuck we were doing. And, and, and the fuck that... This is insane. Why are we doing Why are we even there? What's going on? That only we, has gotten... Well, rather, I lost my train of thought here. Yeah, so give me a second. I'm checking my audio. It takes five minutes to find active, like, in the last couple months, combat footage from Ukraine. And, excuse me, that's where shit coming out. One second. I need to do an audio check. Alright, your audio is your audio's a little bit louder than mine. That only has gotten, well, rather, Here, I'm going to, I have an idea. I'm going to lower the screen volume for you. And then, yeah, that should work. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay, have, have you not, have you been able to hear me fine this whole time, or is it? Yeah, the whole time. I turned you up a little bit, but, you know. Okay, I think just because your, your audio is a little bit louder than mine, because I have my screen audio pretty loud, but... It should be yeah. fine now. Right, but you can on. literally watch it live on, on Facebook. Yeah. Here, like just listen, said, listen to the you know? listen to the screen audio really quick. I'm just gonna start the video really quick just to make sure that the mm -hmm. that you can still hear the screen audio okay. Alright. About that. Um because I think this is really interesting. I mean I, mean, I care about could, could you hear that fine? Yeah, I heard that fine. Yeah, okay, fine. good. Let me wait, let me hear let me make sure the audio our audio is about the same volume. Yeah. Okay, it's still. Wait, your, really yours is still way louder than mine. I'm gonna have to figure this out. I, w I wonder if my audio is even like connected to. You have like a uh, some kind of audio mixer. Uh no. What, what might happen is because like I don't know if my, I don't know if my like actual mic is plugged in. That one that I'm supposed to be using for. Let me see if I can plug mm -hmm. in my better mic. Maybe that will work. Well, to answer Williamson here, um, I was referencing. Vietnam, I believe. Wait, for which one? For the war that was highly televised or not highly televised? Uh, highly televised, I, th I think. Before that, we were talking about World War II. Because it wasn't. But to my understanding, the Rape of Nanking King was like, not known until pretty well after the event. Uh, maybe like, maybe the U.S. government and the U.S. military knew about it, but I don't think... How does my audio sound the public now? Knew. Does that sound better? I'm trying to use like, you, sound, you sounded fine the whole time. I don't know. It's for the video, I think. Like the stream. Hold on, let me let me check the actual stream. Let me let me hear how my audio is now. Give me a second. Technical difficulties, guys. My apologies. And it's 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 um the lag is a little bit. Let me, let me see. Does that sound better? Okay, it's louder now. Good. Good, 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 good. All right, cool. Um, Do I sound quieter now? What's up? I guess it's better now. Anyway, um, so what were we talking about? Okay. We're talking oh. about, like, um, the justification. So, like, you know, do you have a better moral stance to justify? Or do you have a better ability to get away with, like, sort of, like, atrocities and clandestine things if you have a moral backing? Yeah. And I think... It's, it's not just about getting the... Actually, I suppose it, it is... It's still a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, if you're very upfront about it, people will probably expect you to do very clandestine things. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean, right? But... But they're going to be looking for it more. Yeah. Because they're going to expect it. But then so I think you could just get more, caught with your just, pants down a lot easier. Sure, but if you're just, like, already saying, like, I'm going to do these things anyway and you don't really care, then, like, you're not following the Geneva Conventions. 
You know what I mean? Oh, that's a fair point. So it's like, I don't know. It just seems like it, it's it, it, if if you're like straight up fudging the rules. Like, look at ISIS. Do you think ISIS cares that they they break every international law that exists? No, no, no they don't care. But so, that's also because they're ideologues. Yeah, but like any any they like don't... any any um entity or state that is is trying to just is that doesn't care about morality is generally an ideologous or like a very ideological state generally or they're just like or, or they're just playing the game yeah i mean if that no but the, people that are playing the game are gonna no but people that are playing the game are gonna try to claim the moral virtue the moral right to be able to like uh wage a specific war you know what i mean like if you're playing the game you're not just gonna be straight up i think no, yeah, I'd say you're definitely way more likely to, to take the ball high ground because again, it's a PR move, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, and then you, but oh, I. That's a good point. That I'd say right on the the clandestine thing. Um, however, the other major thing that having good PR gets you mm-hmm. is way it's way easier to get support mm-hmm. from other nation states. It's also also way easier to build influence yeah on the world stage and then to maintain that because if you're viewed as like oh man there was i think i I think i told you about this i was having a conversation with um people about what is what is china's biggest concern Mm -hmm. what's their biggest thing that they would want to focus on Mm -hmm. is pr yeah definitely it's how they appear to the rest of the world because they they want to appear Mm-hmm. Like a democratic, fair, morally just nation. Yes, and so no, that the rest but... of the world does not ostracize them and, and demonize them. Yeah, but it's like with with China, it's to the point that everyone knows they're bullshitting. Oh yeah, I think yeah. now. Yeah, oh, sure. now they're kind of fucked. But at the same time, they've mm-hmm. while attempting while while staying like while just trying to like stay under the surface of things yeah. and just kind of mind their own business and look like a nice little country, you know, the People's Republic of China, right? Mm-hmm. At the same time, they were doing what they actually want to do, which is building up enough power and influence over the global stage or global economy mm-hmm. so that no one can interfere with what their future plans are. Sure. And they're nearing that point because, of the, like, for example... For example, there are very, very, very few nations that will publicly support Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And because... And I would say, or rather, I would say that is indicative of the fact that China has enough of a chokehold mm-hmm. on the global economy mm-hmm. and global resources that people won't cross them. Most people. Right. Um, but I think I think part of it is also... Part of it is also the fact that, yeah, part of it is PR, but at the same time, I, I feel like it, I mean, it all comes down to power, right? Uh, PR is part of it, but if you kind of accept, to, to a certain extent, because like, look, take China, for example, right? Who are their, most of their major allies are either somewhat of a dictatorship or, or a complete dictatorship. So like, you know, they're, they're allied with, with countries like Iran, Syria, Russia, sometimes North Korea, um, and then they're 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 sort of building up their nation building in Africa, Cambodia, other Asian states, and as their nation building, those countries are going from democratic to basically being Chinese puppet states. So yeah, I guess um, at least publicly saying we're a democracy or sort of publicly saying we're doing things out of justice. I guess that yeah. that's kind of like they kind of got to do it, but at the same time, I don't think anyone really buys any of that. It, it, you know what I mean? Like it just. It, it, I don't think anymore. I think more people will buy that the United States is trying to interfere into a country to quote unquote like spread democracy than people are going to buy China going into. Yeah, because we've built up more of that. Yeah, we have, we have more of that. Sure. and we also have a greater influence. Yes, but I also think it's because it's China doesn't really tap. Because like I guess what I'm trying to get at is I don't really think China taps into the whole you know, moral, uh, justification, democratic state type, uh, type, you know, 
uh, foreign policy. Like, I think that China spends very little on actually trying to come off as democratic because they kind of understand at this point that we see... Like, China is trying to become an imperial power themselves. You know, they're trying to... They're trying to expand their influence within Asia. They're trying to uh, nation build now in Africa with their One Belt Road mm-hmm. Initiative. They're trying to build up developing countries, you know, throughout Eurasia. Like, uh, mm-hmm. they're doing all these things that are indicative of an imperial state, right? But... Yeah. The difference is, I think, with the United States is it's this idea of creating a global hegemony uh, of different democracies, whereas China is is just oh trying to spread the Chinese Chinese power. It's just Chinese power. With America, it's, like, it's mean, never about America spreading American power. Time. Yeah, but but it's different, though. Yeah, it is. The public <laughs> perception, and not only the public perception, but... You're right. Perception, public perception. To, to an extent, though, perception's reality. So if, if you as America say... Uh, we're, we're trying to spread democracy, then then people that have American intervention in their country, even if they, they don't end up having a successful democracy, they're still going to have this idea of, of like, okay, we are our own individual democracy. But when a state that accepts its imperial identity, like let's say China, for example, if it ends up doing that, um, when they go to a country and essentially um, put their own a friendly government in power, that country is going to know that they are subservient to China. Whereas the government that America puts in place still has this, has more of a semblance of independence because the United States says we are spreading democracy. Whereas China will just, you know, basically say we're protecting Chinese interests. You know what I mean? Sure, but they don't frame it as, they don't frame it publicly as protecting Chinese interests. But what do they, what do they? They don't. What do they, like, publicly? They they frame it as more of, like, a we are... Typically, especially with Africa, mm-hmm. they, they frame it as aiding poor countries, aiding needier countries. From a position of power, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure, from a position of power. Like, so, it's always underhanded. Yeah, but... Same with the United States, but it's... But the reason we see that it's more underhanded mm-hmm. is because we are their enemy. Sure. Um... Yeah. Really, like I don't think I don't think China will ever blanketly go out and be like, no, yep, we're completely authoritarian. We are here to become the primary influence in the entire world, control the economy as much as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. They're never going to do that because their entire nation and political system is built on lies. Sure, but at the same thing. Yeah, so I don't disagree with that, but at the same time, like. So look at look at the United States. When the United States does something that we consider nation building, right? That country becomes its own independent identity eventually. Like we have put puppet states in power, but it's never a lasting thing. Even with the United States, you take Japan for example. Japan has become the the world's third largest economy after we nation built, mm-hmm. and that's like our most successful uh, example of nation building. And then you look at even like Iraq and Afghanistan. Those governments are not pro American. We overthrew those governments. Well, and those current, no, they not. also collapsed. Afghanistan they collapsed. collapsed. But, but we allowed them to collapse. Do you think China would allow a government to fought, place to collapse? We fought pretty hard. We dumped a lot of human bodies yeah, into but, that but we weren't willing to and just, failed. Yes, but we weren't willing to go against, like, for example, if China was in a country, they'd probably just massacre anyone who, who revolted yeah. against them. We would never do that yeah. because we would never get away with no. that. China would get away with it. Yeah, China would. Do yeah. you see what I'm getting at, though? So, like, even though but, both of us are trying, to no, I don't. I don't particularly see how that. What well, can I elaborate? That really? Yeah, go ahead. So, what I'm trying to get at is, while both of us are technically trying to give off the um, idea that we're good, China does it in, a, in in less of a forceful way, so they have room to wiggle. So, like, if China, if, if the United States massacres a bunch of rebels. That's going to be on worldwide news. If China does it, mm-hmm. it's just going to kind of be like, okay, well, they're that's what we expect. Like, look at what they're doing to the Uyghurs. Only the people right who are on it. Well, no, because well, look at the Uyghurs. Are we doing anything any anywhere close to what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs right now? Of course not. No. Exactly. And would we be able no, to get away with that? We've been that kind of shit for like two and, years. Right, and we wouldn't get away no. with that either. But the Chinese are getting away with it. 
And it's because they give themselves more wiggle room by, yes, they do say, okay, we're nation building. Okay, we're trying to pacify the world. We're trying to improve the economies of African countries. But there's enough wiggle room because they're not pushing it that hard. They're not pushing it as hard as we are pushing nation building and spreading democracy. They're only pushing it to the extent that, you know, it hits the surface level requirements. I think think it's also because they're less overt than we are. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting. That's what I mean. They're less that. overt in their actions. Yes. Well, their actions. Uh, well, it's all about the public. Yeah. If they're is, they're way more hardcore in their propaganda. Way more hardcore in their propaganda than we are. Uh, regionally, right? Yeah. So way within more. China, for example, and and yes, and to an extent, like their state being involved in propaganda. But if you think about, um, if you think about like. I guess it really depends because their propaganda comes through state streams and our propaganda yeah. comes from the free market. comes so, through corporate-owned corporate media. Yeah. yeah, so it's like it's a little different the way it functions, but essentially... Yeah, like the, the, where the interests are coming from mm-hmm. is is indeed very different. But I would say that one of the main reasons, or not maybe not I can't even say main, but one of the reasons they could get away with genociding the Uyghurs... Mm-hmm. Is because firstly their propaganda is like super heavy on they would we would never do that you know no 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 well, we're not but that's all, that only applies and to then, the Chinese people no because that, no but that's what they're saying to us they're denying it all yeah we all know what's happening the whole world really knows it's happening yeah. but 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 the, one of the, the other it. reason why they're getting away with it is because on the mm-hmm. surface level it's all propaganda right they're not admitting anything mm-hmm. and then underneath that yeah the the mechanism that keeps them running is mm-hmm. their I would I would say it's a it's a form of playing the long game, right? They like they've ramped up their hor- horrific shit mm-hmm. proportionally with their control over I don't know, let's just take like fucking uh manufacturing. Yeah. Right? Like it, in proportion with each other, their horrific shit. Mm-hmm. Their like crazy moves and Actions in the South China Sea and around Taiwan that all like has increased as their control and their influence over the world economy has increased. Mm-hmm. So, what- so they're only being more obvious about it. Mm-hmm. Because they know they can get away with it. Yeah, they know they can get away with it, but I think that... Because so, they produce, like, all the cheap shit. I guess the, the disagreement we're having is I, I believe that they... So, all right. So, so just rephrase what you're saying really quick. So, you're, so what's, like, the, the, the brief summary of, like, why you think they can get away with the Uyghur thing, but we couldn't? Um, they can get away with it because... Enough of the world is dependent on them for cheap manufacturing, cheap labor. Sure, I mean that, that that's, that's true. Uh, yeah, well I mean that's like the of, main, that's the big one. Well, that's like a reason why, like most of the Islamic world, for example, isn't saying anything about it, despite the fact that the Uyghurs are Muslim, because the Chinese supply, uh, you know, weapons to Iran, Syria. They have mm-hmm. deals with all of like the Gulf states. That's part of it. That's right? why we don't do anything about that. Yeah. So I see that, right? But I do think that there is an idea of like the sort of national spirit of a country. And if you if you exhibit a national spirit that is less uh, rooted in, in moral justification, then I think I do think that gives you wiggle room. Because it's like if I say – if I go up to somebody, right, and I say, okay, um, I'm going to – if I, I'm trying to think of a good example for this. Uh, all right, if I say I'm going to donate $100 to this person, right? I, I swear, I'm going to donate $100 to like this homeless person, but I only give them $20, mm-hmm. right? People mm-hmm. are going to be like, what the hell? You said you're going to give them $100. Why do you only give them 20 right? So that's obviously, people are going to get mad at that. But then if you never say you're going to donate any money to the homeless person and you give them $10, that ten dollars is still less than the twenty dollars I the other person gave, but because that person who gave yeah. the homeless man ten dollars didn't they put the intention yes, out there. Yes, exactly. They didn't put the intention out there. So it doesn't matter that they gave less than the person that had the intention, but because the person that had the intention said, I'm gonna give you a hundred, the twenty felt like a lie. Whereas the person who gave no money at all, there was no like 
opinion on that. So I'm trying to use that as an analogy for because China isn't claiming to spread democracy, they aren't claiming to to do mm. things heavily oh. out of moral justification, they can get away with more things. And I'm not denying that a lot of it's because of their international presence, um, the reliance... Okay, so I see now what you're... I, I, I think I understand. I don't even think we really disagree. Okay, so you get where I'm coming um, from now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that you've reframed it, mm -hmm. or... If, essentially, now that you've rephrased what you were saying, yeah. put a nice little bow on it with I'll that analogy. This. So, like, it's like uh, Jared and Patrick make up like this. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. More, more. So, um, agreement. I, I see what you're saying, but it, again, that definitely draws back to how they appear to PR, right? Mm -hmm. To their public relations with the rest of the world, because they need to appear like enough of a developed country to be a part of that global stage. Yeah. But also like poor enough to where people are like, oh, it's fine for you to be literally the single largest producer of fossil fuel mm -hmm. ever. It's fine for you to like destroy your own environment. We don't give a fuck about that. But yeah. America, you better fucking toe the line. Well, well that's because that's what we claim to be about, right? So if we, like exactly, take, yeah, right. like you take so, the Paris Climate Agreement. People all mm -hmm. got mad at Trump for pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. But first of all, the Paris Climate Agreement never did anything in the first place, really. It didn't, yeah. Um, no. But because it was well, non-committal in the first yeah, place. Was, was, what's the point of joining? It up? was all about the intention, though. It was the intention and the message yeah, that Trump yeah, yeah. sent by pulling out. It wasn't that the Paris Climate Accord actually did anything. It was that Trump, you know, it was, it was that America, you know, wants, you know, for the most part, Americans want, um, you know, a, a push towards environmentalism, right? And, mm -hmm. and Trump pulled out of that. So, but it wasn't because the Paris Climate Accord was good. It was because of the intention, right? So I, I guess, what, mm -hmm. you know, intention does have power because, you know, if you, that's why I always like, this is a funny thing. Like if you're in a, <laughs> if you're in a relationship with someone, don't, be the best version of yourself in the first month of dating them. You should be exactly no, yeah, who you no. are. Don't don't try to be exactly who you are. Yeah, exactly. Be who you are because you don't want them to be disappointed when you like if you start off too strong, they're gonna think, wow, this guy's so amazing. And then when you go to like your normal average, you're gonna seem like bad in comparison. But if you're just who yep. you are from the beginning, then it's like, okay, I know who this guy is, right? But I think that's a lot of problems with like dating, for example. Like people have that honeymoon phase. And it's like, great. And then it, it normalizes. They're like, oh, well, this isn't giving me the high that was originally. And I think that, and, you know, it's a kind of weird example, but it's true of. That's a kind of a weird example, but, but I can see how it kind of fits in with the concept of expectation versus reality. And, exactly. And intention versus action, right? And I would agree that because China never puts out any, like, public statement of we're going to clean up our country or we're going to spread democracy. That's not what they do. Mm -hmm. They just talk a lot about it. How I I think that's another thing is they don't put out that much. Who? China? Like China. They yeah, yeah exactly. That that, that's attention. what I mean. Yep. That's why I said about the whole homeless man thing, the person who doesn't say he's gonna but, give any money. If he gives yeah, yeah, but they, great. But they also I'm trying to think of a way to uh, freeze this. Sure. But that's why maintaining that almost semi-radio silence mm -hmm. is so important. Because yeah. people just ignore them. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, Despite so, being... And, and, and then they focus just on the economic side. Sure. Right? Um, because they have nothing intention-wise to get pissed off about. But they're like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> most of our manufacturing comes from there. So we can't quite, you know, yeah. cut ties with them because they're performing a genocide. We can't do that. Well, That's not allowed. I mean, the same thing applies to like public opinion. Um, like you take Kanye West, for example, like how many people <laughs> are there with the same thoughts, like racist thoughts as Kanye West that are silent every day. But, you know, because <laughs> Kanye went out of his way to say all this stuff. Well, now Chase Bank. So um, it's okay now. He watched 21 Jump Street and he's cured. Okay. <laughs> what? Did you see that? No, I gotta, I gotta, is that meme? Dude. No, he said. Uh-huh. That 21 Jump Street cured his anti-Semitism. That's funny. I'm gonna oh, because of because, um, it, yeah, yeah, because of Jonah Hill. As yeah, just because Jonah Hill is so Jewish, apparently. Right, I don't even know. I'm trying. gonna look that up later. But what I'm getting at though is like take the memes have been good. The memes have been good. I'm sure they have. But you take Epstein for example, right? Like Epstein yeah. was one of Chase Bank's uh, major clients, and despite the fact that some of like there's claims that Chase Bank knew about it, there actually haven't. There was like a whole 
Um, they 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 attempted. I think it was um, it was like the DA of like the Virgin Islands or something tried to like prosecute or she tried to like start a case against Chase Bank and then she was like she was forced to resign like a week later or something. But like basically, there's allegations that Chase Bank knew about Epstein's island and they didn't do anything mm-hmm. about it. Why didn't they do anything about it? Because it wasn't public knowledge. So they could, they could get away with their relationship with him because people didn't know that he was sex trafficking people to an island. But with Kanye West, because everyone knows he's anti-Semitic, they have to kind of do it. So like public perception matters Got in him. terms of, same way with China. If China isn't talking about all these things and the world doesn't know about it, then okay, let's just do business with them. I guess that's kind of what you're getting at, right? It, it's not just let's just do business with them, but mm-hmm. when it comes to... When this shit comes to light, mm-hmm. the first thing they focus on is, well, we do shit that in business with them. <laughs> and it makes us a lot of money. Yeah. And they haven't really said anything like they would do this or that this was their plan or that this wasn't their plan or that they would never do this. So, like, we're just going to keep quiet. And they're just going to keep quiet. And we're just going to ignore this. Yeah. Crazy, right? Anyway, um, is there anything you want to talk about, or should we continue? Because we we went on a long tangent. We did go on a pretty long tangent there. Um, <laughs> I say we just continue. All right, cool. I'm gonna timestamp this as like video resumes. <laughs> video <laughs> that resumes. was like, uh, if I'm, my timestamps are correct. We started talking at 17 minutes in, and it's now an hour and five minutes. <laughs> Hey, so I'm a, I'm this is what you get it. for inviting me on here. Well, you know, I have good conversations with you. You're fun to talk the to. The more I'm on here, the more this is going to happen. I That's good, uh, though. I'm a rambler. Know? Like, do we just want to react to stuff, or do we want to actually give our no. actual opinion, The, the right? point of this is, you know, to add content, exactly. to add value. Yeah, like, people don't want to just see me watch this interview. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to start it. Right, go for it. Delivering this solution, right? So, so I want to I want to get to the heart of it. There's, there's two possibilities there, and the answer might be both, but I want to get a sense for which one you meant. Um, one is that that sustained meaning. Is that what you said? Sustained purpose. S- me, yeah, the, uh, sustaining meaning. Yeah, sustaining the, meaning, meaning yeah. that'll sustain meaning. you across time. Right, sustaining meaning. That, that can pre-exist and be uh, resilient across catastrophe in a way that this this superficial idea of happiness. Yeah, tradition does that. Tradition, tradition can be grounded. Yeah. If you're yeah. embedded in a tradition, right. yeah, you bet. You bet. Right. But, but there, there's, a, there's a version of what you described, which also makes me think about a very different direction here, which is that you can also form that in response to catastrophe too. And yeah. so I think, I think much of the social structure that we have created in absence of that purpose and vacuum, I mean, this might be a cycles of history thing, less about psychology and more just about the nature of history here, is that we create the conditions for that catastrophe, whatever it might be. And it might be that catastrophe itself may have to be the catalyst for rediscovering what that sustained meaning was Facts. across across those circumstances. Or that future, be that economic like World catastrophe, War II. I think. That we're absolutely. Due for absolutely. I mean, well, I think I think any like major catastrophe, we've yeah, over the last will years amidst like, come from the China, current culture, this favor, and will then the create States. the next one. But yeah, strengthen, create the, the, the foundation right? for and new that, strong one. In, in first principles, developing that to be resilient Point. across time, or it could like, for example, or you just fall. <laughs> most of modern philosophy comes from the rejection of the philosophies in place during World War II. In absence of this, we're talking like postmodernism. This is a response, at least. Yeah, postmodernism. Yeah, yeah. We'll be right back. First, we wanted to give. Ah, looking at your advertisement, Mr. Peterson. I would say that you don't. Have, like I would Daily say Wire over here trying to get me to buy shit. But to I, I, will never, I, I will never. I will never subscribe to the Daily Wire. You don't have to think except when you're failing. <laughs> Not a fan. The purpose no, they're essentially like to calculate they're like a, a conservative version of most of your mainstream left wing. Producing the desired uh, results, you know, then your media theory group. is attacked. Well, then the question it's all partisan is, bullshit. Well, how much failure is yeah. necessary to make you think? Central. That's actually yeah. a moral question, and that's a question of willful blindness. You know, if you're awake and alert, and if you're humble in the classic... Ad blockers can't sense, work in this Jack's Law. This is part of the actual video. Where yeah, it's like a section of the video. That. 
because it's in the Daily Wire. It's it's not a YouTube ad. For example, is tragically tragic. The Orthodox uh, cite that continually, chant that continually, is a reminder that you're insufficient in your current form, and you should be looking for what would rectify you. That's the practice of humility, and the advantage to that practice is that you can make micro repairs instead of staying stubborn till the apocalypse Oops. happens and then collapsing. Now, in the in the story of Moses, what happens to the uh, Pharaoh? No who's oh, a tyrant, video glitch is that the crises emerge and then magnify, right? They just get yes. worse and I worse. I love how Jordan uses worse. his hands. And he utterly fails to Very expressive respond. speaker. And the yeah. consequence of that is that his entire society is devastated. The consequence of that is I sound like the Frog. All killed, and the Red oh, Sea I can never, well, like two new videos about that. Dude, just close your eyes, close your eyes, bro. The Egyptian Empire. Who's talking? Who's talking? Be, be, with his Sith hood. The question is, <laughs> podium. <laughs> what's the relationship between failure and and a return to abiding and sustaining values? And the answer is, well, it depends on how stiff you are. This is going to be a good, good, question. <laughs> good question. This is a good question. I was knocking on my door. Hold on. If you're stiff necked right enough, and right, this is no die. joke, and I mean this, if you're stiff necked enough, then you face the apocalypse. Hmm. And we're toying with that at the moment. On like that's exactly where we are. That's exactly where we yeah, are. Yeah. And I think that I think that, in certain sense, my goal in this journey is to make sure that that doesn't have to be the the catalyst for deliverance. Okay. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Because if it's not going to be somebody who delivers a vision, but from a from a actually conservatively grounded perspective, with the conscientiousness of a conservative that still brings a creativity of vision to this. Well, then it may gonna it may have to be done by force, by way of apocalypse, anyway. And in you know, in the modern sense of that word, we're gonna have to be yeah. forced to learn the lesson that we couldn't learn ourselves in the first place. I don't think we're quite there yet, and I do think we have a window yeah, to get yeah. this right, which is the entire premise of. I mean, you have verbalized using words what I feel in my uh, in my bones, in my heart, that compels me to want to do this. Better than I have at any about that? last week. Well, who was it? So I've watched a lot As, of people uh, in the last five years. One of my coworkers. Embark on co careers. Yeah, a friend of mine who apparently just like walked. Many people on the Democrat side, many people he's, on the Republican side. He's getting panned and he was walking well. back and he just and like that. This is what I see happening. on. Based. So neophytes enter the political arena. Now, they may have been people who, like you, have had a pretty stellar career and have racked up enough successes so that they can present themselves as credible candidates. And you know, two thumbs up for that. I, I think that's a necessary precondition. But they get intimidated in the new arena because the stakes are super high and they don't have a lot of experience. And so what they end up doing is they end up hiring communication teams. And there are experts at political communication and they usually involve pollsters, for example, and speech writers, people who will help you craft your message. Yeah. And then what I see happening, and this is inevitable, this is the inevitable consequence, is that the person running loses their voice. And they often lose the election too, by the way. Mm. They lose their voice and the election. Now, not always, they, sometimes they win, but they still lose their voice. So, and one of the things that's emerged is the opportunity- He's talking about how, how new political actors will just fall right into now, the machine. Yeah, which is I really think that's what he's talking you know, about. For 40 mm -hmm. years, Politicians, in some sense, had to craft their message because they had selling to pass your soul to the, the devil, narrow essentially. Bandwidth of legacy media, right? And so they'd had to compress things into a thirty-second sound. They were forced to, right? Yeah, right, right. But now, now you have the opportunity to just say what you think. Mm -hmm. And if you just say what you think, well, first of all, if you're wrong, you'll learn, mm -hmm. and that's useful. And the other thing is, is that people are going to respond positively to that because they're desperate for truth. Mm -hmm. Now, you can tell that because Trump was successful. Now, I'm not trying to put Trump out, you know, on some pedestal, up on some pedestal as the world's greatest truth teller. But I would say <laughs> that one of the things Trump did was speak without, without, you could say without forethought, but that isn't exactly Without inhibition. Right. So without inhibition, that. is what I yes. mean. Yes. <laughs> Basically, yeah, not wrong. For, for all of his flaws, he just yeah. he looking did, shot from he, the he goddamn hip. Especially the working class is genuine. Because that was low-key a compliment and a thought. criticism at the same and time. And what was cool about that was that he won. Yeah. 
And yeah, so it's like a backhanded really compliment. And and to see, you know, I think it was backhanded. In, I think it was just yeah. an honest field, assessment, you know, which happens to definitely be, a yeah. be both a compliment. I was going to try to make a joke out of that, but I couldn't come up with it. Play out, but one, so I just stopped. That I think you have, yeah, it's good. Failure, apart man. from your financial background <laughs> yeah. and the fact yeah. that you were alert to the dangers of ESG tyranny and so forth, which is a non-trivial example, is that you can really afford to take the risk. You know how to use the new media, and that's a deadly advantage. And also, you know, your, your candidacy is sufficiently unlikely so that there's no reason for you to do things in a conventional manner because conventionally you should just lose. You're not well enough known, <laughs> yeah. right? And you don't have enough of a political apparatus. Around. I don't have a machine, but you it, know. Yeah. And right, so, exactly. so actually, but that could be a huge advantage. You know, one of the pieces of help I'll ask for you is keep me honest through this whole thing because that's where I'm starting off. I can imagine that there's a lot of people who embark with that vision and then just become stultified by the suffocating forces around them. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple of rules of the road that I've, I've, you know, okay. t- tied my hands to the mast to make this easy for me in a good way. Is no one's going to write another speech for me. In fact, even when I great, give speeches. Great. I don't write my own speeches. Base. I just say what's on my mind. I don't use a teleprompter. Base. In fact, if a fun, I haven't, I haven't said this yet. A fun little Base challenge I was speaker. thinking about issuing yeah. to the entire Base Republican Vivek field. Ramos Maybe I'll just Not political right reader, political is, speaker. Yeah. Don't have anyone yeah. write your speeches and don't use a teleprompter. I'll make that commitment. I, I, I back that. that. Teleprompting is no stupid. No teleprompter, yeah. speak from the heart, get it out there. And, and you know, one of the things that we're going to yeah. do is, I've learned pretty early on, what you're supposed to do had a teleprompter is you get trained behind closed doors. And then people Hell, train yeah. you and prep you with their talk points. And you come on, put on this nice suit and tie, and then you you, you project yeah. to the world how much you know about words and terms that you just learned 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Why that? Instead, actually, what I've said is, and, and I think we're actually gonna this do this so, and over the objections of, yeah. of good advice, is all of my policy briefings, all of my education? I mean, there's Spire a lot. honest politician, anybody, myself included, yeah. for or sure, aspiring politician, I suppose. Yeah, because he's not a politician the yet. States. That's a big part of the next year he and a half, and I am running man. to run. I'm not running for to make a point. I'm running because I believe seeing this all the way through is my max is the ticket to drive maximal positive change. That's going to require a lot of learning. Facts. We're just going to tape yeah. it in forums like this, and we'll put it out to the internet. And you know what? If Base. that allows yeah. people to discover that I was not omniscient, hey Vivek, great. I sent you, I, I sent you an email you know, to do an interview. radio interview yesterday Who's where somebody boy? asked me about some term in in U.S. military history that I should know. <laughs> well, I didn't know it. I told him that, but I said I'm also a fast study and committed to learning. Which that's I think good. You should always admit when you don't know something because that's how so you're going to learn quickly. I just think that I think that. Always remember. How would they say by giving a brief, a right? Way. Yeah. I think this you don't know something, say you don't know, but tell me you'll find out. Speeches exactly. That other people wrote for us. I do not if know at this time, but I will find out. Even teleprompter stick into some script, but speak. And then you actually have to like follow through That's it. That's what I'm committed yeah. to doing. I hope oh, that yeah, keeps sure. me honest. I, I have a lot to learn, and not only am I going to learn it, we'll open source it. Everybody can learn along with me. He's got a That's one of the ways we're going to do this thing starting about next month. We do got a fresh cut. Well, if you... And if Jordan you, got if you thin in hair. use prepared speech, you don't have faith in your heart. Yeah. You know, you don't have faith that you can Facts. respond to the moment in accordance with your principles in a dynamic manner that will involve the audience. And Facts. if you can't do that, A, you shouldn't lead, and B, you should learn. Because you can do that. You can learn to do that. And, and uh, people do respond to that much better. Like, I've experimented with this on YouTube, because now and then... I'm trying to think through something really difficult, you know, and I'll write it out because you can make a more coherent argument yeah. in writing and a denser sure. argument. But then I've tried to read it on YouTube, you know, and it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Like it works okay. You know what I mean? It's that not a was. failure, but it's not a success. The last mm-hmm. thing I did, this was, so this is a hybrid that's worth experimenting with. So I wrote this uh, statement of vision for this enterprise I described, the ARC enterprise. And, uh, I wanted to share it with people, so I was going to read it, but I knew that reading wasn't very compelling because it didn't have that spontaneity that reveals the heart, let's say. So what I did was I read like two sentences and then commented on it. Hey, and that's then like what we're doing. I like that. We listen yeah. to two yeah, seconds really and comment because, on it. You see, it enables <laughs> for like two yeah. hours. Well, it enables you to. to yeah, well, like that's the beauty of uh, two form discussion. Yeah, but it, it it was it was very effective for me, and it kept the spontaneity, you know, and yeah. so. And 
you, you, gotta, you can't, you can't plan for that. You just got, but, but I think you have, to, you have to in some ways be disciplined about making sure that you don't just revert to the natural norm of just sticking to what you need to say. And you know what? You're right. I think there is something about legacy media that, that sort of forces that. But I don't Absolutely. like just blaming legacy media too because I, yeah. I go on a lot of TV hits as well. I don't think you have to do it that way either. And in a certain way, I think that the last best chance for reviving legacy media is if the people who go on it Start beha- stop behaving like the cartoons that legacy media created for the last 30 years. Right. This could actually right. be the source of saving legacy media itself. Just because you're given three to five minutes doesn't mean that you actually have to stick to those talking points. Try doing it this way too. That's what I try to do when I go on television as well. But anyway, this is, yeah. this is good. It's much more effective. I mean, I've I mean, done- Maybe it's effective and maybe it's not. Media. Right? Maybe it's a fact. We'll, well find out. This is an experiment for me. But here's what I'll say is even if, even if, if you were, even if you were more likely to win the other way, you have your soul sucked out of you, right? You're just a hollowed yeah. out husk of yourself. So if the point of winning much, was yeah. to go sit in the White House, then, okay, that's one thing. If the point's well, actually to drive a they, revival, you're not going to do that even from the White House if you're just a hollowed well, out husk of yourself. In a sense, he's I calling out the game. I don't think there yeah. is any evidence that just you're not saying it. to win doing it the conventional, kind of handled, poll-driven he's media. He's around it. Yeah. Naming, he's dancing way. around it, yeah. I think, I a little bit. I like it. I can't though. see a shred of evidence. There's hardly any evidence that election spending is not as associated with straightforward. Trump. Good. It's not. There's. <laughs> Listen, there's I'm gonna get rid of the deep state, bro. <laughs> that was straightforward. Is completely irrelevant. It was wild. <laughs> yeah. There's some minor evidence wild. on the challenger front that more spending makes the difference. But you can't tell if that's because of the spending or because the more popular candidates are more likely to raise money. So, and you know, if you look at someone like Joe Rogan, Rogan's very interesting figure, eh? Because he's basically created a whole media empire out of nothing. He yeah. still has nothing. He has he has his producer. Awesome. He Love selects it. all his own guests. Yep. Well, and all Rogan does is expose his ignorance. <laughs> Because all he does is ask stupid questions. Good That's good, though. I, I don't know the guy, but, yeah, but I'd like to meet smart. him some boy. He's being humble and willing to learn. Hashtag Joe Rogan interview the Vic to actually running a presidential and political campaign. That's what this is going to be. And so maybe it's, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly betting it's a formula for success. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think so, but I'd rather stay true to who I am and actually putting that on full display and being open about learning through the yeah. process and open sourcing that than trying to do this in some way that projects some image of some omniscient guy, which is exactly what the political consultant class wants to do, right? right. They want to say, Absolutely. hey, your position they to craft lead. Everything. They, want, exactly. they, they want to project the image of a leader. But who cares if that leader doesn't actually exist? Exactly. And so that's how we're going to do this. And, and you know, a year and a half from now, we'll find out whether it was the electorally successful strategy <laughs> or not. <laughs> Probably but not. The personally su- for me, it's the only way that I'm going to be able to do this, and so, and so it'll be a fun, it'll be a fun test case to see this all the way through. Well, I would say psychologically, there Jackson, is no that's a very fascinating take. Success than something approaching. Every time I watch Rogan, I feel sorry for it. <laughs> because the truth. Yeah, he says he hates his life and he feels like he gets off. I don't. You. I don't think that's and true. And so that. Yeah, he, he seems like he like loves his life. Proximal success. He like works moment. what maybe three four right. times a week. Dude, his job is fun. Like, if I could get you know, paid for podcast, bro. In some cosmic just talk to people. Get paid to talk to people. That's why. I'm interesting people that I get. I choose. Yeah. But I would say psychologically that. speaking, yep. that if you and they want to talk to me, like, <laughs> oh, easy day. Hey, one day, brother. And you one make day. the sacrifices we'll, we'll necessary to make that podcast. That your candidacy will be a success, regardless of the outcome. Mm. And you might think, well, that's kind of paradoxical. It's like, look, no, it's not. Yeah. Because, for example, you might you might tilt the discussion of the election in a direction that's extremely good for the country. And that could be completely independent of whether or not you win the presidency. In fact, you might even do that more effectively by running a campaign that wouldn't be, you know, crafted this time to put you in the optimal political position. And I've seen this with other political leaders, you know, like I talked to Netanyahu a while back Uh, and he really risked his political skin and his party's political skin to bring in necessary economic reform in Israel. And that crashed his party and him for like a decade. But... He's back. I have seen Israel is thriving Netanyahu. on the economic front, so you don't know. I'm not crafting it and at all. I think. I think. I don't think I was paying attention to exactly things at that time. So I don't. And maybe that's uh, my bet 
is that's going to be what successfully I mean, puts me in the White House in 2024. But I don't fetishize that. And, and then there's the inverse of this too, Dr. Peterson, which is you could craft it to win and check the box of winning the presidency. But just because you yeah. said the other way doesn't necessarily mean you lose. This other way doesn't necessarily mean you even win. Even if you actually no, numerically no. win the election and sit in the White House, who cares right. if the person sitting there is just a stuffed suit that certainly was knew how to just craft to how to shell. win? Yeah, that's definitely not calling out anyone right now. Yeah, something of substance left on <laughs> the inside base. of who occupies base take that Vivek. stuffed suit. So, so it goes Alpha in both directions actually. I think that's yeah, absolutely. Vivek. I think that's yeah. an almost or inevitable. Virgin. I wish I could draw. I would. I, I, I wish I could draw. The memes are so here's one of the reasons right the universities are so ruined. Okay, so a graduate student says to himself, well, I can't really say or write what I think. No, an undergraduate says, I can't really say what I write or, or say or write what I think. I have to get my grade. I'm not going to do that. So he I'm compromises right what, what he says and thinks. And then he's a graduate student. And he C. thinks, well, oh, now I'm a little higher up in the hierarchy, but I'm still not a professor, so I can't really say or write what I think. And then he's an assistant professor, and he says, well, I haven't got tenure, so I better keep my mouth shut. And then he's an associate with tenure, and he says, well, I'm not a full professor. Finally, when I become a full professor, I'll be able to say what I, and write what I think. And then he's 35 or 40, and for 25 years, That's a good he's point practiced he's deception, and he doesn't have a word of yeah. truth That's left a really to utter. Good point. And that happens to political figures all the time, and that's a totally. real defeat. Totally that's true. And you know so what? True. I think that that's the real, that's what winning and real losing really ought to be defined as. And then we're making this empirical bet. You pointed out to Donald Trump in 2015. I think empirically, and their intentions. you know, my, yeah. my, my bet is where yours is, where that in this yeah. moment yeah. probably is the more electorally if, successful strategy anyway. Yeah. But I'm less sure of that than I also, am Jack's sure that law, this is how I'm going to do it. I don't really watch Because that's what's in my control. I prefer Lex Freeman. And, and that's how Lex Freeman well, is smarter keep, than I would love to keep talking so. to you. Check out Lex Freeman's podcast. I mean, I've been really podcast. fortunate over the last Lex Freeman is right. Yeah. I'll watch both of them here and there, and there but if they have an interesting guest. Yeah, I just don't like Jerome's podcast that much. Have their own independent viewpoints. That's fair. I just don't like where he brings the conversation. Who constantly are interacting with me and making sure that I'm not going to be able to do it. Because Lex Freeman likes Lex Freeman brings in a very intellectual fashion. Yeah, that too. There's been some pretty intense discussions. Discussions about talk, that at multiple you know. times, but it is Rogan's very useful. Like, to people around about who you talk through your strategy, yeah, but he you just laid out. And say, look, guys, I'd like oh, you to keep an eye on me. It, and if you think I'm striking some false notes, or I'm starting to be, you know, I don't know. I enjoyed both their the projection of the leader that you know you can rein me in a bit. And you know, if you do put that goal to keep control of your tongue. First and foremost in mind, then and then you have people who can reflect that back to you. You know, you can stay on the proper track. And I think the idea of of not letting people I just can't believe political figures have other people write their speeches. Yeah, it's like I mean they the do way, though. It's have other people craft your thoughts. Yeah. No, it's utter, it's utterly insane. It's nuts. It they'll say I'll channel insane. your thoughts, but you know, as as you know, whoever said it, language carves yeah, right. the channel through which thought flows, right? Yeah. My English my eleven grade English teacher basically beat. said that, right? If you can't write it down yourself, you probably don't know what you wanted exactly. to actually say. That is so fair. But anyway, here's yeah. here's an ask that I'll have for you. I mean, honestly honest to God, and you're you know, the program, et cetera, you do call me back on here and call me out or don't call me back out here and call me keep me honest right yeah. if you're, yeah, if you're seeing a drugs, deviation from this okay anyone in my shoes deserves I mean, to be called out like and, and roasted over it no. because that's what like, keeps us okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, this would sure. be an interesting thing to do sure. in terms of what I can bring to my audiences no, anyways I mean it. you're going to enter this fray Full flat no, out for the it. next year and a half. Well, also, there's, Why don't we check in about every three months or so and we can play that by ear. Um, and maybe they can just like, provide us with an update. I think we talked no, about that. And then we can walk bit, everybody like, through the whole through experience and we can talk like, over these issues uh, continually. In his opinion, and you call me out like whether you think I'm actually staying uh, true to what I'm setting out to. Yeah, that's been a clinical study. Let's do this every few months and then and and I'll give you my honest take of how I think things are going. And because he doesn't make this like his thing. <laughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm it is, isn't related to, to his opinions or his we might as well call it message or anything he does. Yeah, he's literally Even synonymous with Joe Rogan. Polling, but I'm becoming some, uh, some hollowed out husk of myself. Yeah. Let's Part of just the call meme. it a day yeah. and move on because that's Definitely. not really what this whole enterprise was about. I'd love it. I'll take you up on that. Okay. Okay, good. Well, I'll keep an eye out and I'll try to ask you the most difficult questions I can ask. <laughs> real questions and that are fair. You know? Yeah. 
And so that, that's always the grounds for a good discussion. We managed that today. It looks like we can do this because we did this with Michaela on Michaela's show a while back and it worked yeah. well. And today I thought went extremely well. It zipped by and we covered all Are we already done? I are you kidding me? I thought we were just we, getting warmed up. We are. No, we're <laughs> already done. They're done? Are you kidding me? Oh, we finished it. Minutes. Stuart, oh, yeah, we okay. actually oh, finished it. I thought we were getting that's warmed up. Okay, okay, okay. You know, it's like, what, two hours? Yeah, we actually did it. I didn't think we were going to do it because keep talking so much. Okay, this is a good place to wrap up. Good. Well, I I, for everybody who's Yo, watching and listening, thank thanks. you for your we time and attention. We did it, I'm going to move with Vivek. Over hour and a half to, the to cover what, platform. like 40 minutes? We're going to go through some yeah, autobiographical background. Yeah, it's better than last time. We one hour and I'm two very hours. interested always in investigating hey, to find out how people... It's a good time for me, right? It's actually like one hour and two hours because we spent the last hour and a half just talking about I could, I could watch a, uh, an hour-long movie with you and spend four hours. Once we get big enough... Um, we could just like, and uh, so just you can turn to, to that if you <laughs> want to follow up on the discussion. VA, thank you very much today. Well, that'll get your shit taken down. You want to do that shit when you're congratulations yeah. on your candidacy. Huh? It's then a was watching, you know? thing to undertake, and uh, you're going to be in for quite the roller coaster ride the for the next the eighteen months. I mean, I know you're familiar <laughs> with that sort of thing already, and so I look forward to talking. What to level of the game are you referring to? To those of you who are watching and listening, thank you for your time and attention to the film crew here in Calgary. Still in Calgary. No, Thank it's you not. For your Wait, time I might today. just be say who uh, played the game better. Your Wait, technological who's he talking prowess. About? And we'll who, who turn it over to the Daily Wire Plus and ciao, everybody. Uh, ciao. Peterson. Hello, and, um, everyone. I would encourage fact, you to continue. Hey, you want to play some chess? Huh? Oh, fuck chess. Why not? So bad at chess. chess. Let's play some chess. Well, I can try. Yeah, let's go for it. Why just because, like, you know, people need something to watch. So They need something to watch? That's true. That's true. I've noticed that's a. I feel like that's such a problem for me, though. Like I really shouldn't need something more to watch, but yeah. for whatever reason, Let's play some I do. Together. I'll try and play. I might get too. My my worry is I'll get too consumed in the chess to that's focus the on fun of it, and then you mess up, and it's fun, you know. All right, yeah, I'm gonna add you. Or actually, add me as a friend because I'm already on the game screen. Uh, here, let me type in my. And everyone else who wants to play chess, let me know. <laughs> that's my, that's my chess play. thing. I've played with some people from like the Discord on chess.com before. Yo, did someone knock on my door? I don't think so. Gimli would have been barking. All right. Probably like they turn into a chess stream, know. guys. Chess stream. Yeah. Yo, let me edit it. Let me edit the name that's of the stream. Great. Other. Philosophical ponderings. Oh, I spelled ponderings wrong. What the heck? Oh, no. oh, ponderings isn't a word. That's why. There you go. It wants me to put in a. Add it. I, I get a friend request. Yeah. While I'm gonna add while playing chess at the end of it. While playing. I'm not trying to chess. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I took that most of the to Cover up your fucking mistakes. Yeah. All right. Um, you friend requested me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me. Let me accept it. All right, I accepted it. Time to play. What kind you. of chess do you play? Uh, I'll do 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Oh, 10 I minute can rapid. handle 10 minutes. Yeah. Yo, what was your username again? Okay, I'm about to add you. Right. Ren. Oh, wait, I got to refresh my screen because you just added me. All right, guys, if you guys want to play chess, too, at some point, let me know. I, I like playing chess. So play me, y'all. I love chess. I'm a very chess chess kind of guy. Very chess-oriented man. Quite fun. What's up? It's very fun. I mean. Yeah. All right. You're not that bad. You're 790. Uh, could be worse. <laughs> I don't think I'm that. I don't think I'm good. Maybe it's just because, like, um, I'll play every once in a while with a buddy of mine who's, like, 1200, 12, 1300 or gotcha. something. Just, All right. right. He whoops my ass every time. I'm trying to play you, accept my friend request. I mean, my game request. Where's the. I didn't get the notification. Ah, there the notification just popped up. I'm going to put it on the Discord. Like, if you want to play chess, let me know. Shit. Stream going. has turned into a chess stream. <laughs> stream has been turned into a chess oh. stream. Tap in if you want to play. Uh, I want to try and like get it, get at whatever the hell. Yeah, Jack's, Jack's Law. Law. You play chess, Jack's Law. He's been. He's been I, I, I'm just not sure like what in the hell has he been referring to. <laughs> this entire equation, I just don't. 
<clears throat> Dude, everyone left as soon as we started playing chess. I guess the people don't like chess. Damn, <laughs> they don't play chess. <laughs> I'm sad. That's right. <laughs> I can also just world. <clears throat> or we could try and move it into like a public forum type situation. In the yeah, Discord, I want to make it a public forum. Like I have more cooperation. I could get unruly pretty quickly. Is a thing you can. Having like a public forum situation. Oh, it in the can Discord get unruly very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it can. But I really want to know, like, what, what the hell? Because I'm just fascinated by this character of Jack's Locks. He talks so much <laughs> about AI, but like, wh why so much about AI? I understand that AI is an extremely, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also not. Oh, it's your job. I, mean, like, I think he's just talking about. Wait, whose whose job is better? Who played the game better? Give me the people I'm trying to determine who played the game better, Jack's Law, because I'm not sure. Uh, he's 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 referring to Vivek and um Jordan Peterson. Wait, but what do you mean? How they're not against each they're not playing against each other. I mean, like we were talking so much about political theories probably coming from that same mindset. I guess. Yeah, I guess. I mean I, guess. I don't think either one of them really played any game better. Yeah, I think they were just you know playing having a friendly conversation. Dude, I can only win one point from this game. <laughs> and, yeah. and you can win 15, I think. Uh, I'm probably going to lose anyway. I'm just kind of making moves. Sure. You're, not, right. being, you're not being bad. <sighs> you're just, yeah, you're, you're doing all right. Really? Come on. You serious? <sighs> Yeah, I know, I know. I, I just, I wanted, to, I, I always try and move to castle. Also, I could have I taken know. your knight this whole time. I just realized. Huh? <laughs> I could have taken your knight this whole time. I just chosen not to. Uh, sorry. I mean, you've built up so much infrastructure around it, but you also haven't. Like, no, I haven't been paying attention enough. Yeah, you really haven't. Yeah. All right. I guess I'll do it now. <laughs> Might as well. Ugh, God damn it! I did things in the wrong order. I fucking hate when I do that. <laughs> Retard over here, bro. Oh, we can't use that word. Oh fuck! You're, so gonna, sorry. you're gonna get me demonetized. <laughs> That's my bad. I, I will never use the word again. Yeah, you better not. All right. Forgive me. Oh, right, well, oh, oh, world God. Oh wait, I'm in a bad move. Or not necessarily a good move. Not a bad move per se, but not necessarily a good one either. You know, it's like, it's kind of like in the middle. The now. Have you seen that movie, The Room? Yeah, of course I've seen the movie. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, oh shit, I made a horrible done. move. I just made Did a you? terrible move. Oh my You're god. I wasn't paying move. attention. Because I'm yeah, kind of being an as, idiot right as now. It happens, right? Yeah, that's what also, I, I, I got lulled into a sense of security because you're doing bad. Yeah. 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 Um, the problem is, can I, like, be the horrible it? move? I'll just tell you. Can I capitalize on take, take, I'm just going to tell you because I'm going to try to work out of it. Take my pawn with your rook. Oh, you mean this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I can't take it with my knight and my king can't get away, so... Yeah, right. I pinned both your knight and your queen. I have a to your plan king. though. Oh, so that's that's a really good way. It doesn't way really to get around it. that. Not, it won't really get around but it. Then you're just gonna. Oh no! You should have you should have taken my queen with your rook, no. because then you would have gotten away with the queen. Now your queen no, can get taken. I can still yeah. get a, no, no, I can still get away with no, the queen. No, because I'm about to take her queen. Oh, you're fucking! If you took my queen oh, with your yeah. rook. Then yeah, I, yeah, but I you just you fucking you have your rook right there, yeah. so you can just fucking take. Jeez. Yep, never mind. Not very based of you. And then we just we both we both are down. It's now. not very based of you. No, nah, not really. It's like the opposite of based. Actually, no, we're not both down. You're actually going to be worse off in this situation than I am. Um, no, I'm saying we're both down the queen. No, because you're going to be down a queen and a rook. I will be down a queen and a rook. Yeah, so but like the only option is really to take the. Sure. You could have been, like, we could have been, like, dead neck in the middle. I just realized that there's an even better... I just like, realized I just, that I my life would be time. meaningless without you. Oh, really? <laughs> no. I think you. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be meaningless. It'd just be slightly less colorful. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
despite your pastiness. I'm glad I had some amusement to someone's life. Yeah. Oh, why? Other, other than my own, to be honest, I amuse my myself like all the time. Is that base or point. cringe? I don't know. I don't know either. I don't care. Uh, that was base. You not caring? Jeez. That's so cool how you like not care. Dude, no one no one stayed for <laughs> No, no one stayed. No one wants the, to watch us play chess. chess. Why not? No chess one's is so chess. fun. I love it. I love chess. Because because no one fucking cares about chess. Dude, why? Why? I hate chess to. So I hate to tell you this. No one fucking cares chess about chess. Is so like, based. I can't think of a more based game than chess. It's sad that no one cares about chess because it is a really cool game. I think you misspelled but... cool as based. I mean, you misspelled based as cool. It's a based game. Sure, sure, sure. Let really me put in the tag chess and chess streaming. Maybe some people will see it. <laughs> Maybe. When I when I stream on Twitch, when I stream on ch- we could Twitch, we could what's up? We could, we could just move to the Discord yeah. and try and like discuss with the audience. Perhaps that. Yeah, would but I'm inviting I'm inviting people in the Discord. If they're not calling in here, then they're not going to call in on Discord. You know. That's true. Because yeah. I'm inviting them to call in on Discord to talk here. Anyway, mm. what was I going to say though? Um, on Twitch, generally, I can get a decent amount of people to watch me play chess, and then because like the Twitch algorithm is really good, like it doesn't matter if you're a new creator. Generally, they'll like find a way to get people to to watch your stuff, which is nice. So that's pretty base. That's nice. Dude, I'm right. just using base too much today. Like you so really are. You can like use it too much. I mean, dude, it's fun using it. Just such a good word. And like it's fun to use it in in places where you probably shouldn't use it, you know. Yes. Like just call random Believe things it. that aren't based at all based, and just like random like just bother people. Like, what? How do you consider that based? You know. I feel like that words become so meaningless. Yeah, kind of like your life. Sorry, I didn't have to go there. I'm just gonna make a genuine response to him, just for the fun of it. <laughs> um, you ever watch BoJack Horseman? Yes. Yeah, I never. I gotta finish that show. I only watched up until the second season. I was rewatching a couple episodes with my dad. That show is good. It's a good show. Yeah, pretty good. I I, I I only watched the first season or two. I never really continued from there. Yes. I got a little too sick of, <clears throat> I got a little too sick of the actual character of BoJack. I yeah, that's the whole point, right? The point is to not like him and be sick of him and think he's kind of lame. Well, because he's like incredibly lame. What a fucking douchebag. Yeah, but like that's what makes him interesting. Like he's, you know, he's more human than like most human animations, and he's a horse. You know. If that makes sense. <laughs> I don't think I don't think that really tracks. You ever have those I have some like leftover Mexican candy from Halloween. It looks kind of good. I'm going to try Mexican, it. Leftover Mexican candy. Well, like from in Halloween. case there are trick or treaters. I I live in kind of a, like a place where there's no trick or treaters. Mm-hmm. Um you always have leftover candy from Halloween. Yeah, there's zero trick or treaters at all. So well, I mean, but why this, did you specify? This is the first year Mexican. I lived here, so I didn't know. Shameful, fucking shameful. God. Let's see how this candy is. I'm about to rate this candy. It's called Red Windows. This is a candy rating show now. I'm deciding to give up philosophy. I'm just gonna do candy rating. Yeah, I kind of have no. I'm just gonna fucking take whatever. And then you take the night, and then. This is not even good. The candy? It kind of tastes like prunes. Don't fucking eat it. Yeah, I already put it in my mouth. I'm gonna spit it out. I don't know what the hell you're doing. I have nothing really. I'm just kind of moving. Mm-hmm. Get my death over with, you know what I'm saying? Oh, shit. Yeah. Why? Why did you make a candy taste like a prune? I don't know why they would do that. Seems kind of like not a good idea. 
if I do say so myself. All right, I'm about to. I'm not, you know, I'm not a candy designer, so I don't. Is that what they call them? Questions. Candy designers? I don't know. I don't even know what to say if they're called candy designers, but I'm going to call them that. Because mm -hmm. I want to. Oh, that's a nice little... They're nice trapped. job. Mm -hmm. Very trapped. Right, I'm just going to pre-move all very, my moves now. It's very based of you. I'm going to pre-move my moves just to see what happens. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Okay, my pre-moves were somewhat okay. If you rewatch the stream, you'll see that I'm just trying to do pre moves to see what happens. Or All right, I probably won't go. rewatch the stream. <laughs> the shame is too great. Um, no, I just don't really. I don't particularly see a point. You? Oh shit! My pre move messed Damn. up. <laughs> that was not my intention. Oh. Um. Damn, bro. That's tough. Well, that was my chance at winning. No, I think I lose my chance. No. Yeah, because... Can I checkmate with a queen and a queen? A draw? Did we just bishop? do all the... Did you all that can work I to go to a draw? checkmate with a... Knight and a rook. A knight... Wait, no. A knight and a rook. Let me see if I can do it. Because I'm going to try if I can. Because that would be kind of cool. It's not a rook. It's a I knight mean, uh, and a bishop. Yeah, that's what I meant. Can you check me? Thank you. Okay, I can do it. I can do it. I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it for like the meme, just for like something, like some challenge today. Wow. My joke to you. A little bit. All right. I gotta get you cornered somehow. Well, I don't you're gonna really have know to do how. that. You're gonna have to do that before we hit draw. Right. We're not hitting draw. Cause I'll just run to free space. All right, I gotta figure this out. I gotta get you trapped somehow. I don't really know how, but we'll figure it out. There's a strategy to it. Yeah. Oh, that was smart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're getting somewhere now. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Duh. I'll just take this to draw though. Like if you just keep doing this, I can just take it to draw. It's not just repeat. You gain seven points and I lose seven points if we draw. No oh, wow. Mm hmm I really don't know how this checkmate works. <laughs> but I'm gonna figure it out somehow. I'm sure you'll get there. Mm hmm Absolutely. Okay, I think that was good for me. You on purpose? You just gave yourself less room to work with. I the other way is actually I would argue probably worse. See, this makes it a little bit of a challenge for me. This is a hard checkmate to do. Is it? Well, you tell me. Look, how how the hell am I supposed to do it? Uh huh. Mm hmm. Okay. Um. Actually, I think I think it has to involve your king. Mm -hmm. You have to utilize all three pieces. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that wasn't ideal. Hmm. Hmm. Well. It's kind of fascinating, like, trying to figure this out. This isn't easy. Nice, nice. That's what you want to do. Okay, I just got to make sure I don't stalemate you. Okay. Hmm. Pretty sure all you really need to do now is get the knight involved and you pretty much check me Yeah. Here. Or you accidentally stalemate me. I think that's the uh, 
the crux here. That's the issue. I don't know if that was right. Hmm. Do you watch me run out of time before I'm able to do anything? <laughs> yeah, I think that's very possible. We just we just run out of time. Yeah. Even though you totally won, like. Yeah, I decided to be. Oh shit! I know where I should have gone. There we go. Yeah. Oh shit, I almost still made it do. <laughs> Alright. Hmm, that's the only place you can go. Fuck, how do I do this? <laughs> if I go there, you can go there. Alright, I gotta plan this out. If I go there, you go there. All right, fuck it. I'm t it's too close. I gotta try some stuff. Oh no! Why did I do that? No! Why? Okay. Why? Fascinating choice. <laughs> so who dies? Right? Who dies? Right. Everyone does. I just lose anyway. I tell you right now. Move to bishop. Why? I think. I think it is. Possible. No. You can't. Also, we're checking with, with the with bishop. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Draw. You're not even gonna let me get the satisfaction of taking a piece. I just accept that draw. I'll accept the draw. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I can't believe it. That's Four hard. blunders. So usually, I would say that I was being cocky, but here I wasn't. I was just trying to challenge myself. How do you yeah, do you fucked though? up. Man. I gotta look at images. How do you do that check, mate? Oh. Uh, do you see my screen? That's well. Look, are you on the live chat right now? Um, no. Okay, let me see if I can send you this on the Discord. Hold on, let me let me look at it. Let me see. Well, like it has to catch up though. It has to catch up, so it'll pop up eventually. It'll populate. I'm just gonna text it to you on Discord. Oh yeah, yeah. There's two ways to do it. Either an open space or in a. That's the one. That one is a stalemate. Now let's check. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see it. Mm-hmm. Damn, bro. Gimli, what's wrong? Oh. Dude, this guy is such an attention whore. Who? My dog? My dog, yeah. He's constantly wants attention. When are you going on leave? Um, like May... 16th is my flight. You wanna, my you flight. wanna dog sit while I'm in Maryland? When are you in Maryland? From April 30th to May 13th. You and your girlfriend can stay here. I and don't you know if I can Because I'm going to the field like twice. When? I don't know the exact dates. I I, I could try and find it's the exact that, dates. But... that time period though? Yeah. It's oh, some okay, point. It's in April. Then. Twice in April. Yeah, but sorry. April 30th I said. Oh, it's April 30th to May, May 13th. I might miss the first couple days. I can get someone to watch the first couple of days. But uh, after that, yeah, I could probably do that. Yeah, just because I've been asking the same person to house it all the times I've been gone. I don't feel like asking him again because I don't want to constantly have to ask him. You know what I mean? I don't want to burden him. Yeah, with that. that's how they do. But anyway, we'll figure it out. Anyway, you were trying to re reinvigorate discussion somehow. Yeah, we could try. I don't think I don't know what really you. What, what topic? You know what we could do? What? Uh, but I don't know how I'd get you involved, too. We can like, go on those, like, one of those video chat things and just randomly talk to people about philosophy or some shit. <laughs> I don't think we could be able to pull that off. No, you know I could do? I can go, like, on, on Omegle or something and just ask someone to come to Discord. Be like, hey, we're doing live stream right now to talk about philosophy but then what if like someone's dick comes up i can't like censor uh, that yeah I don't know about that. it's not worth it i think it'd be better to try and do it maybe in the why well, i'm on some like i'm on specific um servers we talk about like politics and stuff but nobody wanted to oh, this talk so about politics. 
Well, not just politics, but like philosophy and stuff, but no one wanted to talk about anything. Dude, that's fucking no sad. Where? We can react to some good, videos. What's, we, what's, what's a good question to start a conversation here? Can we just react to some videos, like some philosophical videos or whatever? We could. Hmm. All right, let me share my screen. I don't know what you watch, but yeah. Hold on, let me, let me, let me set up a fucking, hold on. What? A watch together. I can get this running. Why, the screen share thing wasn't good? Um, it was, I think, I think it's just more efficient. This way as well, I could see the video and not just, because the video is like super glitchy and fucked up. Mm. But, it was always fine. You said it's called watch together? Yeah, hold on. I feel like I might have used it before. Yeah. You probably have. I wouldn't well, now, be surprised. Now all of the stream is going to learn how to use watch together. We're all going to learn. This is, this is super yeah. useful, though. For, like, create room? Trying Are you going to create a room? Yeah, I already, I already made a room if you want. Or you, like, well, let me create a room so I can pick the video. Yeah. Yeah, you're the, you're the big I host man. I want to pick the video. I'll let you, as the big, big host man, to pick your big host video. I'm going to name myself Quavis. That was my high school nickname. Yeah, you can make an account. Good for you. Alright. What the heck? They just started a random video. I didn't even get to pick. It yeah, it's, you, you can just watch. search it, though. You can search it. Um, do I gotta send you the Nothing. room link? Yeah, you didn't invite me. Alright, now everyone else knows the room link. Yeah, if you guys want to watch together. Oh, that's... Me up. Hey, I mean... <laughs> that might do. That's true. Alright, I sent it to you. God damn it, why is it open in... I fucking hate that. Gimli. No, I don't Can you that. relax? Can you screen share and watch together, or is it only, like, individual videos that you can do? What do you mean? Like, I can't just share my screen on this. Like, I have to actually find a video to post into... Or to, like, put in the YouTube link to watch it. Or can I share my screen with you on Watch Together? No. Share your screen with me. Never what mind. do you? It's... You don't need to share your screen. Never mind. <laughs> I don't even know you. <laughs> what is it? What? It's fine. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Now what do you wanna, what do you we can either do? paste. I don't know. I'm, I'm really not sure. We could we could go down a couple major rabbit holes, right? I mean, we could get into fucking. We got, we should watch some short we... content. Some short form, some of the little ten minute things, you know. Even shorter, dude. Shorter, like thirty minutes, shit. Go on YouTube Shorts, you know. Mm -hmm. You have any videos on YouTube? Like good philosophy videos, no, like man. Good videos, like that are not kid, short. As a kid, that are funny. Oh no. <laughs> no. But no. For the best. I never had the commitment to fucking go through with that. I cannot finish this candy. It is dreadful. Then, then just throw it away. I did. Okay. Jeez. I thought you were like. Okay, mom. I, I'm, I'm surprised you hadn't thrown it away before. Like when you tasted it and it was disgusting. Why did you continue eating it? Uh, I felt some sort of duty to finish it. Like, I, got, I thought of all the kids that had duty. to deal with that candy. We could watch. Board, and like, I got to stay in solidarity <laughs> with those kids who like Dance actually on. enjoy that stuff. We could try seeing. Hmm. I mean, I always love going down that rabbit hole of ethics. I find ethics very interesting. Sure. Dude, we should react to someone reacting to something. Let's see if Destiny... Oh my god, no. Going. No, that'd be hilarious. Does he have a live stream going on right now? Oh, I don't think he does. No. Oh, he doesn't have a live stream going on right now. Lame. Uh, Lame. <laughs> the thing with philosophy videos, they're always like usually like kind of long. Because it's like philosophy. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's difficult to compress it into such a small form, but we could just use it as a jumping off point, right? Yeah. Um. Hmm. Sure. What? But what can we look up? Like, what's some good, decent short form content that we could find regarding philosophy? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of. Oh, uh, want to see some of my? Favorite, I know. Want to want to watch some of my favorite videos, like from philosophy, like the past. Sure. I have a. I guess we could watch. Or we could rewatch some of your, like, your content. Not my content. I mean, like. Just oh, just content, content in general? Yeah, what? Dude, I'm not that conceited. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Here. But then we could, you know, criticize your fucking. 
that would be fun. I love criticism. Just criticize me so badly, please. Here, this is this is an interesting uh, one about masculinity. I'm, uh, it's by this guy named Captain Sinbad. It's a pretty good video. I think I've heard of him. Oh shit! Did you uh, get what I sent you? Or is it starting for you too? What's going on, guys? I want to talk about. Wait, is it working for you? What? Is it working for you on Watch Together? Yeah, it's working for me. Okay. Classic masculinity. I recently gotten a comment on the channel, I think on my MGTOW video, in which the viewer said that masculinity is basically a social construct. It's not something that men need to worry about. And around the same time, a female viewer DM'd me on Instagram telling me, so many men today are complaining about the lack of feminine women, but what about the fact that masculinity as it once was is dying? Like, guys aren't masculine in the classical way they were anymore. And I found this really interesting that though both these people would have the opposite perspective. On one end, one guy says that uh, masculinity is a social construct, and on the other end, there's a female viewer who says that masculinity is dying. And so here's my take on this. I don't think masculinity is a social construct. And a book that I think captures this truth really well is The Way of Men by Jack Donovan. In the book, he basically argues that masculinity, or so much of what is considered a masculine trait, actually stems from tribalism. The fact that humans started out in small groups and a person's contribution to that group was their determinant and their worth. For decades people have been talking about a crisis of masculinity. Our leaders have created a world in spite of men, a world that refuses to accept men and doesn't care what they want. Our world asks men to change for the better, but offers men less of value to them than their fathers and grandfathers had. The voices who speak for the future say that men must abandon their old ways and find a new way. But what is that way and where does it lead? As I came to understand the way of men, I became more concerned about where men are today and where they are headed. I wonder if there was a way for men to follow their own way into a future that belongs to men. Being good at being a man can't mean everything, but it has always meant something. Masculinity is about being a man within a group of men. Above all things, masculinity is about what men want from other men. The author basically argues that our civilization as it is today, a sprawling collective of people, is a pretty new phenomenon. Back in the day, people operated in small groups, small bands of groups. And so a man's value to that group was really important to him. His reputation, his honor, was really important to him. The way he was perceived, uh, it meant a lot. And the traits that made a man more valuable were strength, actual physical strength, because it means you could carry more resources, you could provide more safety to the group at hand, courage, or what the author would refer to as gameness, that willingness to get in a fight. This actually comes from a dog fighting terminology, where after a dog in a fight gets his first scratch, that dog's willingness to jump into the fight and actually engage in the battle after getting hit, after getting struck, is uh, that dog's level of courage or gameness, and it was probably the most important, most valuable trait within that dog in regards to its dog fighting, cage fighting capabilities. And the third trait was mastery, man's ability to create resources, you know, be a blacksmith, make weapons, innovation, technology, because the more a man could master his resources and his skill with particular resources, the more valuable he was to the tribe at large. But ultimately it was about being of service to the tribe. And so that's why you see like in troops and battalions from time immemorial to now the larger the army the smaller was the band's like loyalty to it relieved of moral pretense and stripped of folk costumes the raw masculinity that all men what do you what do you think about that um the army the larger the army the lower the it's i think that's the true. smaller it's that's true to an extent to like look at all the special forces groups like they i mean they go through harder training right so less people can do it um i, I definitely think there's more camaraderie in, in smaller units mm -hmm. that are like heavily trained and heavily synthesized together um, compared to like, like look at like North Korea, technically most of their country is militarized, but there's no camaraderie there. If everyone, you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you have a mass army of people that really don't want to be there, um, then yeah, naturally you're going to have less camaraderie. Like militaries are always better when there's, there's some sort of voluntary incentive to be there. And it's like, you know, it's only made up of those guys. So it's smaller. That's definitely true. Do you agree and that, that? that loyalty is so important. Yeah. It's, it's definitely true that um, 
the smaller the military group, the tighter knit they're going to be. Yeah. Especially if the reason for them being so small is the difficulty of their training or the difficulty of their job. Right. And even if you look at like actual leadership, like the reason why small unit leadership is really important, like look at Russia. One of the reasons Russia has been so unsuccessful in their invasion of Ukraine is because they don't have NCOs. They have one officer in charge of like 50 soldiers. That shit doesn't work. You need NCOs. You need squads. You need like groups of five people who know each other really well and have a job and they do that job together as opposed to like 50 people taking orders from one person. Like that shit does not work when the battlefield's chaotic and like you, you lose communications and you get, you know, separated. Like the fog or like the, the fog of war is going to fuck up your plans. And if you don't have small units and small unit leaders to deal with the chaotic nature of the, the battlefield, then you're just going to end up, you know, getting messed up. Yeah. I was curious what you think about that. Yeah. Men know in their guts has to do with being good at being a man within a small embattled gang of men struggling to survive. Compared to women, men are more interested in competing for status, and when they win, their bodies give them a dopamine high and more testosterone. Thomas Hobbes wrote that when men lived without fear of a common power, they lived in a state of war. In war, really every man is war. against every other man. Really this is what I believe is the state of the modern man today. Not having a common enemy, uh, which maybe some would perceive as a good thing. But I would argue it might be somewhat within our intrinsic DNA to always be at war against something as men. Which is why that line from Fight Club really resonated with me. We have no great war. Of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war. No great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression. Our great depression. Is our lives. It's our lives. Now certainly Base. this isn't true everywhere. There are places <laughs> in the world that are constantly at war and it provides tremendous tumultuousness and despair in those places. But that lack of society needing masculinity in the same way it once did, maybe when we were still in small tribes fighting for resources, it actually has led to a tremendous malaise within the average man's spirit. Very Jack true. Donovan noted something very similar happening yeah. with Roman I mean, society as it flourished it's, it's, and progressed. It's not as just, Romans became more successful and their civilizations became more comp- So it's it's like not just needing masculinity per se, it's it's all of the things that masculinity provides. Yeah, it provides like, like, like the back, biological necessity as well. With it. Exactly, like back in the day, the, the reason masculinity exists in the first place, mm -hmm. biologically, yeah, is to fulfill the already. functions of yeah. yeah, but then when you lose that, mm -hmm. what well, you lose, and now you lose the functions, but you still have the necessity to fulfill. But the, the, the wiring is still there, right? Yeah. the wiring is still. So, if so you not, lose the necessity, but the wiring is still there, so yeah. everyone gets all. Well, yeah. So when totally you don't, you don't. You don't the wiring still there. So if you don't use the energy that that wiring provides, you're going to be depressed. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's Pretty that's the very yeah. simplified way of saying it. Like, have we talked about Schopenhauer's will to life before? I believe so. Was essentially that you know in the, in the state of nature, um, because the you know the state of nature is very chaotic. Um, you have to deal with predators. You have to deal with like finding food constantly, finding shelter. Like you know, it's a lot easier to die in the state of nature. It's chaotic. Survival yeah. is not guaranteed. Therefore, you you're naturally more anxious and you're more aware of potential threats. Therefore, now that our society is more civilized and it's only been this way for a small part of human history even if you go back 10,000 years very, yeah it's, it's only very like a, small part. very small ten, like as far as we're aware it's very very small chunk it's like of five to ten percent of our this. history right yeah yeah nothing nothing so our brains have not evolved to and even within that yeah. like think about how many people are still living in the state of nature a thousand year ago, years ago look at the mongols or the other steppe people mm -hmm. even today mm -hmm. how many people today are still living in the state of nature like it's not guaranteed and civilization is so new no so we have not evolved to just think like okay i live in a walled city or i live in a city with police i don't have to be worried constantly because first of all it's not the case everywhere in the world there's still places in the world even in the united states where you have to worry about your survival every day so human mind is still in that place where we are constantly needing to be on guard to survive so that's essentially where the will to life comes in it's basically schopenhauer um, is talking about how humans natural evolutionary functions due to the state of nature cause us to always constantly seek more so like seek more food like you don't know your next meal is going to come so that's why people get obese really easily it's because their minds don't understand 
that that food is constantly going to come. So you should rash. You don't. You don't have to eat it all at once. Because um, your entire body is is your entire body is geared towards sustaining itself for as long as possible. Exactly. So in the very why, time, unless you're constantly losing energy, right, burning calories, I guess you could put it as mm-hmm. you're going to just fucking reserve and maintain that weight for when you might need it. Exactly. So like that's why a lot of people have slower metabolism. Because um, your your body is in the state of nature. Mm-hmm. You never know when your next meal is going to be. It right. is constantly a fight for every single meal and every single peaceful night. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So like you know, it's like the scavenger mindset. Like a dog will just eat food. Any like if you leave food on the table, mm-hmm. it'll fucking take that food from you because it's just it's in its nature to do so. Like my dog's done it, a little asshole. But uh-huh. and it just needs to. Eat. Yeah, it, it it insists that it simply eats. Right, but that 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 applies to a lot of different things, right? So our basic human necessities for survival are food, shelter, water, and sex. So when you end up in a civilized society where all those things are, you know, not necessarily guaranteed, but like most of those things much. are guaranteed. Like food's basically I mean, guaranteed, water, I mean, shelter, sex. At you the know. point we are <laughs> now, it's basically, damn near. Right? You just gotta not be an incel. But, like it's not that hard. <laughs> Uh, it, it ain't that hard. It's guys. not that hard, like, that. dude. Someone called me an incel today. It was so funny. Really? Yeah. But Honestly, anyway. you, the married man. Ha, ah, very funny. Yes, I, <laughs> I am in a relationship, so I, uh, I'm not an incel. Um, but anyway, so. Yes, yes, yes. The man, man in a relationship is an incel. I love that's. Yeah. That's pretty funny. But um, but like they called me an insult and I responded with them. So my MMA account has like my MMA fights and stuff. So I always respond to people that say like weird things with that account. So it's like, yeah, I'm actually a normal guy, you know, I, I, I'm not an insult. <laughs> but I like replied to him. I said, for real in the comment. For real, yeah. Like, no, no, like for real. Like I was agreeing with him because I thought it'd be funny because he probably won't put together that the person who made this video is me. No, probably not. Most yeah. people in the world. But um, I but, think that. Oh fuck! Where was I? Oh yeah, we we as human beings will always seek order. Mm-hmm. Always, we're always going to make it. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the traits come together in masculinity is the creation of order. Yeah. Um, it's like it's a very two sided thing because there's the creation of order and then the ability to put chaos on others mm-hmm. to reinforce our order. Right. Yeah. And that's why you have to stay violent, right? Mm-hmm. But the energy that wills us to violence, wills us to enforce order um, and, and and create order from the chaos that, so like the will, like I'm saying with the will to life, because, you know, for the most part, it's easy to get all these things, food, shelter, water, sex, um, people overindulge in those. And that's what pleasure is, really. It's an overindulgence in basic life necessities, basic things to keep us alive. Like, our whole life is centered around reproduction. So when people have sex for pleasure, that's an overindulgence. When you overindulge in all these things and you're not earning it, earning it the natural way through evolution, so if you're not working out, which simulates, you know, physical extenuation in the state of nature, if you're not using that nervous energy to, like, grow and to, to you know, become more mm-hmm. successful, to work harder at your job, make more money, whatever, you know, work out. If you're not doing all those things, then naturally your brain is going to think that you're not putting enough energy into survival. And that's where depression comes from a lot of times. Not to say that, I mean, there's some very, you know, obviously like schizophrenia and all these things are horrible things, but a lot of what depression comes from is... Yes, we, it's all about, but What's up? I, I would agree. I think one of the best summations of depression I've ever heard is that you're brain is telling you that something is wrong yeah. in the way that you live, the way that you behave, or something. Something in your environment mm-hmm. or your behavior is wrong. Right. And you need to be able to counter You need to be able to counter that so that I mean I don't lost my train of thought. No, I know what you're getting at. Like, because, like, I mean, I... My, 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 my two energy drinks are wearing off. That's all right. No, but it goes back to, like, all right, just to conclude, like, what I'm saying with uh, the will to life. Because we're constantly seeking more, because our brain's still stuck 
in in like the ice age our brain's still stuck in that chaotic state of nature so we're always going to seek more yes. it doesn't matter if we get a new car you're going to enjoy that car for a week then you're going to want a bigger car or a nicer car you're going to want a nicer house everything because our brains are hardwired to constantly seek more because in the state of nature you never have enough this concept of having enough doesn't exist in the human brain so we're always going to constantly strive for more so that is essentially what like the will to life is and it's a very pessimistic worldview that's why people like nietzsche don't completely agree with this because um, he says there is a way to break the cycle, the cycle, which I agree with. But we can get into that another time. But essentially, yeah, I think it's a conversation for another time. But do you get my text? Yeah, yeah I got your text. Okay. Um, yeah, we should. Uh, but, um, I, I th- gotta go to bed. Eventually. I think. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, so do I. Yeah. It's not quite at that point where I'm like. Yeah. I was just texting to like remind you that like at some point we should. We can't talk forever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, I think that um, a major reason why masculinity is so, quote unquote, like dying now, and I, he's you know about to bring this up, is it's it is a very common thing in societies, in greater civilizations, and empires especially, yeah. is that they lose. You could almost gamify it and say that they lose their competitive edge. Yeah, because they're comfortable and they have access to all these pleasures. So exactly. They don't need to seek them. If you don't need to seek these things, like if it comes more naturally, then na- then you know you're gonna have less of an incentive to work hard. Yep. It's like why I mean, do, why do the sons of kings or the daughters of kings and queens or whatever why do a lot of them end up not being living up to the expectations of their parents? Well, because their parents had to fight to earn the kingdom, and their successors were born into the kingdom, right? Like yep. they're given power. It's easy. Too easy. Yeah. Not to say that you know, there's lots of great rulers, obviously, that were born out of rulers. Some of them, but, but it's, it's, it's rare. It, it's not necessarily rare, it's just harder. It's, it's harder to I, inherit I would say it's, it's more rare than... Yeah, the greater the greatest leaders... A really good... The, like, yeah, pretty much all the greatest leaders are self yeah. Not necessarily self made in a sense. But they but had they, to struggle to get to the position of power. The they only, struggled that they did not come from success. Yeah, the only the only exceptions I'll mention, like take Alexander the Great, for example. Mm-hmm. His father was a military genius and basically built foundations for Alexander to do his conquest. The only difference was Alexander yes. just happened to be even more of a genius, which is just the perfect lottery. You hit the genetic lottery. Yep. Um but like, and, and you raised him. I suppose the correct way. Yeah, he was raised in the correct way because his father was, like was tough on him. But like Genghis Khan, even though Genghis Khan was the son of a of a tribal leader, he lost all his power when his dad died, and they oust they like mm-hmm. banished him. So he had to work his way up. Napoleon came from, you know, not not a local pretty, family, but like not a, not a nobility. He, came, he did not come from power. No, though. no. So he had to earn it. Julius Caesar, even yep. though he came from a good family, they weren't in charge of Rome. It was still a republic, so yep. he had to work his way up and earn it. Well, and then you just you look at the five. What are they called? The five great emperors of Rome. Mm. Yeah, none of them none were. None of uh, them. Yeah, none of them were Caesars. Right, they all got picked for merit, based on merit, and and the the Roman Empire flourished. And then as soon as Marcus Aurelius picked his son Commodus, what happened? It all went to shit. Yeah, he was a shitty emperor. As soon as he, as soon as he, well, that was really the key to what made the those five great emperors happen back to back to back. Yeah, because they, they picked, did not go off of her hereditary right, line. They, they only the they picked their successor. How does Jack Laws have two different? Does he have two different accounts, or did he just switch his? Uh, I think he might have just switched his. You know, jeez, nice. What makes a man a man? Way behind you guys. It's the guy. Okay, I don't know. It's oh, the guy okay. that can smash the other guy at chess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about, but right. I love. I Jack think he's Laws. just. It's me, man. Yeah, yeah. But um. I'm always happy to see you, man. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. So the same thing applies to today. We have inherited this comfort. Um, so it's a lot harder to, because you need suffering to create innovation. Innovation comes out of suffering. We created penicillin because of people dying. Uh, we created vaccines because of people dying of diseases. We, we, um, you know, we advanced technologically in agriculture so we could feed more people. Um, we, we started industry so that we could build these great cities, right? But now we live in a time of consumption where most innovation is, is for consumption. So like your Facebooks and all this stuff. They don't help humanity go forward. They just provide 
entertainment, for example. So like a lot of human innovation today is centered around consumption rather than yes. like, you know, discovering like landing on Mars or like Tesla's a good example of a good innovation, right? Like Tesla, that's furthering technological advancement in a way where we can build off of that. That's good, right? But then you take, you know, even though Amazon, great, great company model, right? Facebook, whatever. All these things were great in the sense that they were genius, but besides their 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 methods of consumption they don't really yeah, genius at giving people more things to consume exactly. and creating a, a monopoly exactly so they didn't really um they didn't really create a sort of when i when i'm talking about human innovation i mean something that like we can marvel at like are, are people going to marvel at amazon the way they're going to marvel at you know the moon landing no it's because they're talking about things self landing rocks the rockets that SpaceX is making right like why do people like Elon Musk more than Jeff Bezos because Jeff Bezos is smart but he's not that kind of innovator that's that's literally taking humanity to the next level Elon Musk is that guy so generally despite Elon Musk's flaws he generally has a positive perception eccentricities yeah he's eccentric and that's why you know we're like wow he has a great ambition for humanity and that's why you know a lot of people um I have a positive view of him, right? He, even he, generally, he has an ambition. Yeah. Right? Like, what is what is Jeff Bezos? Yeah, ambition? Jeff Bezos just wants to make money. Make more money for himself. Huh? Yeah, yeah. He's doing good at that, but He's that good, doesn't. But like, what is that doing for human history? Or anything. Yeah. It doesn't. Like, do you know who Mansa? You know who Mansa Musa is? Mansa Musa. Yeah. He's the richest man in history. Oh fuck! I knew his I knew his name from somewhere. Actually, he did a lot of cool things. Don't get me wrong. Like he was able to yeah. centralize his like in West Africa, it's very hard to centralize a state and a stable state. Mm-hmm. So he did a lot of cool things. But you know, he's remembered as the richest man in history. But the then, man in history. but then, so, like, do we we you know I, why is Diogenes more of an interesting figure than Mansa Musa? Diogenes was a homeless man. He was a homeless man who lived out of a barrel. Yeah, or Miyamoto Musashi, or like. You know, look at the great philosophers. Many of them were pretty poor. Why, mm-hmm. why, why are they more interesting than Mansa Musa? Even though Mansa Musa, you know, because we don't worship, we worship wealth in the moments that wealth can be used, like to purchase things and uh, garner influence and stuff. But ultimately, we don't worship wealth in history. We worship innovation. We worship going to the next yeah, frontier. I think, I think that's an interesting context uh, or a juxtaposed way of viewing wealth is that in the moment Mm -hmm. at the time we definitely worship wealth yeah but looking back on history and what has actually made it the biggest impacts it's not wealth no exactly it's it's you know because triumph but but because in the current moment Mm -hmm. wealth is comfortable almost always translates to a comfortable life and uh social power Mm -hmm. that's what we're drawn to exactly so you know people comfort is nice right but like you 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 go 50 years from now and you're like well i lived a comfortable life i haven't done shit in my life you know Mm -hmm. you're you're gonna be like well what the fuck versus somebody they lived a life of struggle maybe they never even made financial success but let's say they put their everything into their craft and they may not be the richest person in the world but they they had an impact in their field Right, so like you take even take people that weren't successful in their lifetimes, like Vincent Van Gogh. Nietzsche. I was gonna bring up Van Gogh as well, like, yeah, or, or Nietzsche, right? Nietzsche, totally it, agree, neither yeah. of these people were successful at the time, but now they are both hailed in, hailed as, as of their field. Some of the greatest of their their field ever. Yeah, you know, many people will say Vincent Van Gogh was the greatest painter of all time, or right. that Nietzsche was the greatest philosopher of the last like two hundred years. Exactly. Um, but, Jack's law says, "I'm not sure if I agree with any of that." Tell us what you disagree with. Or do you disagree with specifically? But um, but yeah. So like, it's not even about success in the lifetime necessarily, but it's about overall impact on a specific field. So you think of like things that shifted history. Nobody remembers, you know, the richest man in the world in 1800s who was a banker or an industrialist. Like to even take the Rockefellers who built all these, um, all these different buildings throughout the United States. Can you name mm-hmm. any Rockefeller completely? It's like George Rock. Is it? I don't even remember the name of the Rockefellers, but that's my point, right? It was, it was like the what's his name, J.P. Rockefeller, right? No, it's J.P. Morgan, right? 
Oh, fuck yeah. See, I can't even name his first name, but I yeah. know. But but my point is, is, they literally built buildings, our historical buildings, and all these things, yeah. and they were the richest people. And they were some of the richest people of their era. Yeah, but we don't remember their names. But we End of all time. Right, but do, but like think we could remember the names of people who who probably weren't that wealthy, but just had an impact. Like you know, we mentioned Van Gogh and Nietzsche. That's not fair because mm-hmm. they were the best. But let's let's just mention guys like um, just like regular philosophers. Like uh, take Epictetus. He was one of the greatest Stoic philosophers of all yeah. time, and he was a slave up until you know near the end of his life. For much of his life, he was just a slave. Yeah. Um, but, but or here's one. Look at all the great. I, look at all the famous slaves that had an impact on the abolition movement, like Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman. Yeah, Harriet Tubman. She wasn't rich. She didn't have any money, but you know, she was literally a slave. But she mm-hmm. had an impact on history. Um, or Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Um, yeah. You just have so many people that. So I, I guess where I'm getting at, it, and you agree, what is, is that it's not a comfortable and wealthy life that really tips the scale in history. It's it's suffering and it's innovation. For, yes. Wait, what's he, what's what is what's Jack Law saying? It's for saying, us knowing and thinking okay, what comes uh, next week and us. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I don't really think that it has anything to do with what we're discussing. Okay, I think I know why they don't count every task. For us knowing and thinking about what comes next weakens us. I'm I know I'm not hundred like percent sure. Genius. I'm gonna have to ask you to elaborate. Jack Laws, because I really don't know what you're talking about. Um, do you want to start the video? Because we've we've been talking a while. Oh fuck yeah, we've totally just we lost the plot I've been, here. I've been like keeping timestamps so I can like add in the timestamps later. So hopefully that helps once people actually rewatch. Organize this. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna try. Anyway, uh, you here? You want to start it? Or do you want me to start it? I'll start it. It was no longer necessary for all men to hunt or fight. Manliness became increasingly metaphorical. Men who did other work could satisfy their need to be seen as men among men by fighting metaphorically, showing social courage, mastering their desires, and behaving ethically. The meaning of the word virtus and the Roman idea of manliness expanded to include values that were not merely survival virtues, but also civic and moral virtues. It was the author Will Durant who said something to the capacity of, a nation is born stoic and becomes epicurean with time. And I, I would argue that we are living in a time of great prosperity, epicureanism. We have all these tremendous pleasures at our fingertips. And if you think about the incredible availability of super stimuli, such as delicious junk food, you could, I'm minutes away from this very moment. If I wanted to become a fat fuck, (laughs) I could just go do that in very short order. Or the fact that pornography is so incredibly available. It's the most potent stimulus that you have access to today and with the rise of things like vr porn and just the incredible hyper stimulus that is on its way with technology it's no wonder that women make complaints such as there's no more masculine men anymore and how uh, some people would make the argument that uh, manliness is just a social construct well I'm sure on some level there is an archetype, there is a social construct element to what it means to be a man. And so that classic archetype of Rambo shooting a machine gun. I would agree that that isn't exactly what necessitates what being a man is. But the truth is, at least the way I perceive it, the further you are from those classic manly virtues that Jack Donovan identifies really well, the traits of strength, courage, and mastery, the further you are from those three traits, the more of a malaise you end up feeling, you fuck with which Rambo, is why Stuart. you feel so terrible yeah. when you're just engaging in too much Base. pleasure without purpose. It starts to feel Base. really yeah. like, oh my gosh, Base. I'm cut off from my source energy. I'm cut off from what makes me happy. Maybe it's one of the reasons why people who become extremely successful as artists or they rise to heights of success too high in their entrepreneurial ventures, they start to feel that feeling of, I could just... Uh, ball out for the next 20 years and some do and that's why they end up losing so much of what made them great in the first place i mean you look at someone like mike tyson the guy went without sex or any form of pleasure for five years achieved enormous success as a fighter and then lost it all he like was constantly sleeping with prostitutes, drinking a bunch of alcohol. He became an alcoholic and depressed and lost his amazing fortune because he lost his stoic traits, his fighter's mentality that 
cultivated all that yeah, success I know, for him. I know. I, you he lost him and, and so that? he fell no. into a malaise. <laughs> really. Society right now doesn't need manliness in the way it once did. Your physical really strength isn't that. necessary to gather resources. Being unusually courageous might make people uncomfortable around you. And while there is a place for mastery and courage in society still, uh, it's no longer mastery with our hands. Uh, the world has become much more knowledge-based, intellect-based, and kind of high level as opposed to being of the earth and engaging with resources and nature in a way that really meant something. However, I would argue that keeping in mind those masculine traits that Jack Donovan mentions in the way of men, strength, courage, and mastery, these traits just feel good for a man. Having these traits and nurturing them is just a source of well-being and like living correctly. When you have more of these, it just feels right. An imagery that I've always yeah, loved in movies sorry. that demonstrates gameness mm -hmm. is when the guy who's getting punched keeps getting back up to the despair and detriment of the other fighter. You see Rocky. this in movies such as Rocky. Cool Hand Luke, where there's a scene where mm -hmm. Paul Newman's character is constantly getting punched on by this bigger guy, and he just won't stay down. He keeps getting back up. This was similarly shown in the movie The Last Samurai, oh, in which I Tom Cruise's scene. character is being That's beaten down a by a far superior yeah. fighter, uh, a samurai, in this village that he's staying, and Tom Cruise just refuses right to stay down. There's something incredibly mm -hmm. yeah. admirable, and I think talking. men can recognize that in other men best, where you're like, that guy's got gameness, Game. and I can respect that about him. I guess what I'm trying to say with this video is, despite whatever society's pressures are or lack of pressure with developing masculine traits, I would say it's at an all-time low. We're at a point in existence where life is totally easy compared to what it was at when we were just man versus nature. There's a far smaller pressure exerted on men to be manly in the classical sense. But if a man were to try to be manly, try to cultivate these traits, of actual physical strength, actual Gameplay, courage, uh, which is what I need to work on the most, trying to have more gameness, willingness to face pain and face the fight, so to speak, Ooh, having that pain, trait, and by eventually. developing the trait Apparently, of mastery, really by working with your hands maybe, but also developing skills in whatever way you see fit, cultivating more of these traits, it just feels good, it feels right and more and more people might start labeling you as someone who is good at being a man in that classical sense. Deficient masculinity is simply a lack of strength, courage, or mastery. You wanna, you wanna deficient masculinity is undesirable. Eyes deficient masculinity <laughs> in themselves. Yeah. I mean, we could... Because they would rather Jesus, naturally be stronger, pausing. more courageous, and more masterful. It's not, it's not deficient like masculinity rarely around... Click the literal pause button. I did, but then like every time I pause it, it stops for a second and then it plays again. I think my mouse is messed up. You might just have to like reclick it. Anger. Well, anyway. Because sometimes it does it to mine, but you nice, usually reclick nice it. But, um, you did there. I like his face. I love pausing on horrible frames. <laughs> um, I mean, he seems. He's. I would say he's, he's pretty on point, especially with the mastery thing. I think yeah. probably the greatest pursuit any man could take is mastering something oh yeah it doesn't matter what like you don't just have to master a completely traditionally masculine thing like if you master ballet i'm gonna respect you like i don't you know like um if you master what's another non-traditional non-traditionally not masculine thing uh painting maybe or not painting but like Teaching, actually. No, yeah, but the first teachers were all men. Honestly, the That's first ballerinas might have all been men, too. Because, you know, like, <laughs> Greek times, like, it was only men that did plays. They I mean, did not. Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, bit of theater tidbit, or yeah. a bit of theater history. Well, let's is say, that it was all men for yeah, a very, very, very long time. Maybe parenting, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be a really good parent. I don't know, but like, like what? I don't know. I guess I'm just trying to think of something that's really traditionally non-masculine. I basically, you get what I mean, though. Like, think like you know when you think of masculine, do you think of like hardcore, like physically demanding things? Like, yeah, typically, yes. Yeah, but like just mastering any art that's like worthy. Like, I, you can't be a master. Uh, all right, you can't be like a master. Um, watching tv or you know obviously <laughs> like it's got to be valid and con master tv yeah. consumer yeah no that's not good or, a master, all of the TV. or like a master tiktoker i'm not going to respect that 
obviously, but you can be master at something very simple. Like even if you're a good janitor, like if you really, like I know it sounds silly, but like if you really care about the janitor, like the the custodial arts, like like let's what is say, a master of anything? What's up? Oh, um, technically they say what makes a master is um, spending ten thousand hours working on that specific craft. That's like the yeah, that's like a semi semi arbitrary se- semi arbitrary, but I do generally think like yeah, if you spend, a decent metric, right? If you spent yeah. ten thousand hours working on one skill, yeah, you got to be pretty damn good at it. But that's like actively working on it. Like if it's just something like breathing, you know, it doesn't matter, or like something that you would do anyway. Like you're not a master driver by driving ten ten thousand hours. Everyone does that. It's like something with intention. Like if you're if you're like actually like driving to race, for example, for ten thousand hours. Oh, you know yeah, what I mean? Jackson does make a decent point. It's about from where you're standing. About Every kid looks at their parents and they're amazing. Um, yeah, it's subjective, but I think it's subjective it to the world. Like from the point of view of a master, sure, what they do is pretty easy. I think I think it's it's about because like I don't think the parents thing works as like a mastery thing because it's like you take specific fields like there are master parents because they are bet mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of subjective. Let's not say parents, but like let's say like um, we'll just take like sports, right? That's generally objective. The person who wins the most games is the best at that yeah. sport, generally. Now, there's some more subjective things like painting. Um, but generally, in that regard, it's who do who do most critics and people who consume this art, what is the v- wider consensus? Then that generally is the metric for mastery. You know? Whether for, for better or worse. Like, I'm sure there's been tons of great artists who have been snubbed because of the critics and the audience and it turns maybe out. an artist I, I feel like it does it's certainly for in, in the context of art mastery it's very complicated yeah because it's subjective but very because it's a very subjective field yeah but if you look at a if you look at something i don't know just take How like, do you measure from you who won like, the chess game uh yeah no, exactly none of us right. won. i mean it was a draw <laughs> yeah it was a draw and You're with chess, you can actually it. prove who's a master because you have to have a certain rating yes. to become a master, and that's a there's specific ratings and there's means of measuring that. And yeah. it, in any comp competitive environment, you can determine who's a master and who's yeah. not. Well, because there's some, there's some, I, there's some competitions that are subjective based too, though. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, like you take that's jazz, true. Like, or just take debate for example, like speech and debate. How do you really prove who won the debate? Like it's it's all based on a judge or MMA for yeah, example. Look yeah. like at MMA. Like how do you know? Like there's tons of bad judging decisions in MMA or boxing. Or bad judging. That's 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 true. That's like you true. have to but finish a fight even, for it to be for I sure. I think there's enough of an objective measure of that. Yeah, but I'm saying it's still like MMA that you can. I'm, I'm like there's still a le- level of subjectivity. There's a level of subjectivity to it, sure. Yeah. But chess is a really good example. That no, it's very objectively yeah. defined. Like there's no, re- you don't need a referee because there's just not. set rule set. Like even in like football or basketball, you could say, oh, the referee screwed me over. But like in chess, it's just yeah. straight up like you play the game. Yeah. yeah, you just play. Yeah, chess is probably the most objective sport there is. Uh, it's technically a sport. Well, I guess weightlifting could be very objective because it's literally the most pretty weights. Yeah. objective. But then you could say, oh, well, that the way he lifted, that shouldn't count, you know. Technique, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think but chess, in chess is just... What dumpster fire. So it's wins. not always possible to get enough social support to become a master of anything, but with art, y- even if you do not really... if you Even if you get really do get really good at what you're doing, it might not be socially accepted. That's true, and if you do really shit work, yeah. sometimes that's accepted. You know yep. what I mean? So it's like you Which is why it's a very murky field. Yeah. And it's, it's extremely subjective in that sense. Right. However, but then, but you know, then you get into the debate of like objectivity and subjectivity, and that's it's interesting stuff to discuss. But you know, it is. I do enjoy discussion. Clout but it's, it's a, is all there. It's a math. Hole, clout is when it comes to subjective things. Yeah, clout helps a lot. Yeah, but like in in, in chess, chess it now, matter, yeah. The only thing doesn't I, matter. The one thing I will say in chess. The only thing I could think of where subjectivity comes into it, like some so the, once you get to a high enough level, um, you take like uh, who they match you up against, and you take like whether you get to be black or white. Generally, in the highest levels of chess, yeah. it's impossible to win as black because they're so good, and white gets the first move. So the only thing you could do as black in chess is draw, like statistically, in the highest echelons. Um, 
So yes and no. It depends on the. It does depend on the version of chess. The version of chess. Okay, so like oh, take the, the, the like versus... random champion. Are you talking about the time limits and so like the rapid? No, 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 not just that. But have you ever heard of the? Have you heard of the uh, Fisher Rapid Championships? No, what's that? Fisher Rapid is a version of chess where the all your actual pieces, so not your pawns, obviously, uh-huh. but the positions of your pieces, your starting positions, are mixed up. That sounds stupid. They're not the default version. That's kind of stupid. Um, that's not chess. It's actually though. really cool I mean, because I mean, I mean, it's, it's not that it's cool. It's that's just why not it's called Fisher Random, right? Yeah. It's not just chess. It's Fisher Random chess. Sure. And the reason I'd say it's so interesting yeah. to see who is better at that mm-hmm. is because then it is just down to raw pattern recognition and decision making skill. Yeah. And of course, they get to see the setup prior to what is he saying? Actually, you know what? What Jack's law just said just proves that chess is objective. If a computer will yeah, beat every just, man at chess, then it's completely objective. Yeah, it's completely objective. There is no way. If 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 you have a computer so good that it will beat any champion existing today, mm-hmm. then that means that there is no room for subjective discussion. One second. I got the Marsoc text really quick. Uh... We're not even in the same league, but we don't watch computers play the game. Yeah, because people don't really root for computers. I mean, that's the emotional side, the entertainment side. But if you're just looking at it from a who's better, what is better, I mean, that's an objective measure. Tomorrow at 13.30. They're not masters. Well, can you beat, you know, Magnus Carlsen? No? No. Um... No, but they're still masters because it, it, there is a set yeah, goal still masters, which qualifies doesn't... what a master is. Is if you get to a certain like international master, international grandmaster, that's a point exactly. Basis. Like there's rules surrounding what it, what it means. People don't just call them a master because they're really good. Yeah. There's like metrics to this shit. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we should probably finish the video, huh? I suppose he's only got he's only got a couple minutes left. Yeah, it'll be quick. Then we can talk more and go to bed soon. You want to start it because my shit's acting up. Though it may result in some general frustration. Despite the moral posturing, men are attracted to manly characteristics. Gangsters are status conscious, aggressive, tactically oriented, ballsy, brother bonded men's men. They are not good men, but they are good at doing the kinds of thing that have been demanded of men throughout history. That's a good passage. I love that line. And it's true. I love gangster movies. And I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. What is it about that gangster archetype that's so attractive to us? It's not that they're good men. They're good at being men and doing the kinds of things that have been demanded of men. It's that result-oriented action, balls to the walls, aggressiveness, and gameness that's really attractive. And not (laughs) only is it a trait that that other people will find attractive in you, they may hate you for it, but it's still an attractive trait. (laughs) But you'll get rid of that malaise. You'll get rid of that feeling of (laughs) being lost in the shuffle and being in a sort of spiritual war because there is no actual war for you to go up against. For a man, life takes on more purpose and more meaning and more well-being when you have more strength, more courage, and more mastery. The next time you sit down to journal or reflect, I would ask myself, which of these traits do I feel I could cultivate more of? For me personally, I know for a fact that I could embody more courage. I haven't been taking enough risks, and I haven't been putting myself out there in the face of resistance or pain nearly enough in the last six months. And so this is something I'm actively keeping in the forefront of my mind and trying to work out. How can I have more gameness? How can I have more courage? How can I embody that trait of getting scratched in the face and still facing that fight. It's something that I really feel that I could benefit from and I'm sure would cast aside a lot of the malaise that I feel once in a while. That's it for today's video. Thanks for watching, guys. And for anyone who is willing to reflect and cultivate these traits of strength, courage or gameness, and mastery of skills, to us I say, greatness is coming. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Oh shit, I clicked something else. That was a, all right, there we go. Good video, good video. I agree with a lot of it. I would actually pretty good. I mean, I mean yeah. Yeah. And I feel like now... Now what? 
it's 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 the topic of masculinity mm-hmm. as big of an issue as it seems in like in public discourse yeah it seems pretty settled once you start discussing the meat of it um, unless you have some real like outlandish takes maybe yeah. not outlandish I, I think can't I, just disregard a take but i think i get what you're saying but like do people want to get to the meat of anything nobody really wants to get to the meat of anything nowadays because when you get to the meat of things um it just uh like people so well, i was doing a stream with uh praise of folly it's the first live stream i actually did on the channel a few weeks ago <laughs> and uh he was telling me the quote so it was one of the past uh, something is it something pascal is it pablo pascal I don't know, this guy Pascal, and he says that the bourgeois class or the, arist- the aristocratic class, they want to immerse themselves in wine and song because they're afraid of silence. They're afraid of a silence yeah. where where they have to confront uncomfortable truths, ask uncomfortable questions, and maybe even come up with uncomfortable answers, right? So people don't want to break down, you know, anything anymore. Like, so that's why as soon as you say one trigger word, someone's going to shut down a conversation, Right, because that's going to lead to uncomfortable truths, uncomfortable answers, uncomfortable questions, and no people seek comfort. They don't want to deal. And, and as soon as you, especially since as soon as you start questioning the foundations of anything, you have to ask extremely uncomfortable questions. Yes. And almost always, the the further you debate these questions and their answers, yeah, you will reach a point that it's a very uncomfortable answer that you don't want to accept exactly and you have to confront yourself too because you are complicit oftentimes in these things that you are confronting so you take society even if you know even if you're not actively contributing to like uh tyranny or injustice in a society if you're not doing anything about it you're complicit in it right so you know it, it opens pandora's box for all these other different things i mean it, it does but then <sighs> The unfortunate thing about such discourses is that you can just kind of ignore them. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You shouldn't though. It's just easy to ignore yeah. them today because we're given we're given all these entertainment, all this entertainment and distractions in which we can immerse ourselves in a virtual world or in like superficial pleasures, so that we can avoid tackling these issues. So like, people will tweet, you know, about socialism and the ills of capitalism from their uh, you know, tw- their newest iPhone. And I'm like, I'm not going to pretend I don't do the same thing. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I generally support capitalism overall. I, I criticize hyper capitalism guys, you know, so I'm not against you having good luxuries, but like I criticize luxuries, but I still have luxuries. I still have a computer. I have a TV, you know, I live in a heated house. Okay. Maybe heated it should be a basic for everyone. Actually, I don't live in a heated house. I take that back. My heater has not worked for a long time since I got this place because I haven't fixed it yet. So I don't have that luxury, but you were all hypocritical to a certain degree, but, but, but it gets to a point where it's so hypocritical that you're just like, well, what the hell's going on? Like it gets to a point where most climate activists today, for example, and we kind of discussed this on Monday, most climate activists are flying around in private jets, you know, yep. their eco footprints bigger than the average person. So it's like, I don't know. It's interesting stuff. Are you a superhero? Is it your job to take on all the world? It's not yeah, my his, job, but I've chosen it. Little, I, I've, cho- little, I've chosen to easier. take on the world, Jack's Law. <laughs> it's like, but if we, we live in a world... Wait, wait. If we live in a we world... We live in the world, we live in life. A movie is being played. Yeah, life's a movie. And, uh, and uh, the question is, are you going to be a character in the movie or are you going to be an extra? I mean, yeah. You are, you're either going to... The thing is, you're either going to take control of your life where you're not. Yeah. Why would you not? Yeah, you're gonna not just why would you not. I mean, like, <laughs> the, the benefits, the pros yeah. to taking control of your life and your behavior and who you are is so much more beneficial than just existing. Yeah, absolutely. But you don't have to be a superhero. You just have to, you know. Well, you can be a superhero if you want to. That's kind of fun. <laughs> There's no such thing as superheroes, though. Just watch uh, The Boys, and you'll see what a real society with superheroes would look like. 
Power corrupts. Absolute, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I don't think I don't think I've ever seen an example of that not happening yeah. so far. It's just all about can someone in power control their corruption and not let it not let it overtake the goodness in them, right? It's like Frodo with the Ring of Power. Um, right, he was still right, right. able to eventually get it to Mount Doom, and it took some help from Samwise, but he was able to eventually throw the ring into the fire. But that's not to say the ring didn't have an impact on him. It did. It's just it had the least impact on him. Therefore, he was the best person to bear the ring, and that's kind of the thing with leaders. Everyone's going to be had a, It had an impact, but he had enough will yes, to not let it and virtue him. to overcome it. Yes, so that's right. the thing with leaders. All leaders are going to be corrupt to a certain degree, but they can't let their corruption overcome the goodness in them so that they can overhaul the net positive, you know. But anyway, um, one thing I want to talk about, or are we still doing the podcast Friday? Yeah? Yeah, okay, should good. be. Good, I want to. Um, one thing I was going to talk about, but I want to like wrap this up because it's kind of late. I was I, <laughs> One thing I had written earlier um, was... Um, fuck, where did I write it down? Oh, I don't think I wrote it down. Maybe I wrote it down here. There it was. I was going to talk about, so we, we had a slight disagreement earlier. Political messages and art. Because you're, I was basically saying that, like, art shouldn't have, um, subversive political messages. And I just wanted to clarify what I meant by that. Because you had a slight okay. disagreement. <clears throat> so I think art, if it's, if it's clear that the intention of the art is a uh, it is a part of like a political I- ideology or a social movement then that's fine what i don't like is when people co-opt a social movement in order to appeal to a wider audience so like the same thing we talked about yesterday with how corporations have pride month right yeah it's the the facade of activism right and movies do that too right or like you look at you know a film will have a subversive message. And I don't want to get into what those subversive messages are right now because there's a lot. But... It's a lot. Yeah. A film will will kind of be saying something. You know, not explicitly, but it'll be, it'll be layered in. And it's not for the sake of art. It's not for the sake of real activism. It's just because they're kind of expected to do it. Like, Hollywood is completely woke um, by, like, you know, the way, the way that, you know, Vivek Rama, Ramaswamy would define woke. And yet, all the people in Hollywood, a lot of them are pedophiles. A lot of them, you know, were friends with that. You know, were, were, were supportive of of like guys like Weinstein, who literally, um, yeah, you know, right. like total sleaze bags. It's it's, yeah, Jack Slaw. Hollywood's I another really too. good. E- yeah, it's fucking disgusting. Yeah, but Hollywood's you hate the word degeneracy. You know? so what? Hold on, hold on, hold on, Jack Slaw. So, what do you mean by you hate the word woke? Do you hate it's too vague, too general? Or do you hate wokeness? Like the concept behind it. Yeah. But yeah, no, Hollywood is, it was a cool word, word back in the day. I think he's agreeing with us. Like it's become, because woke, event, originally being woke was kind of cool. It's like, you know, wow. It's like taking the red pill. Like you're red pilled, bro. You're based. Yeah, you're aware of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's and I would say meditation. that like red pill has gone that way. Well, red pill has gone in the right wing direction. Woke. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Woke used to mean that you were actually counterculture. So woke today is the yeah. ultra left wing view, and red pilled, unfortunately, think, has become okay. ultra right wing. You know. So I think there's a cycle to this, right? Yeah. So every time a movement of something, mm-hmm. woke is an example of this. Red pill is an example of this. Yeah. Even it goes all the way down to like terminology, like based. Mm-hmm. Every time it comes up and it's a counterculture or it's its own thing, it ends up being recycled and fed into the machine because now the machine learns it knows that people want to use that mm-hmm. and so it just starts using it just starts feeding it yeah and now it's no longer it no longer holds any of its original meaning it's it means nothing mm-hmm. exactly um i mean it's like semantic satiation but on like a wider scale so semantic satiation yeah. is you know what that is it's fuck no. No, no, it's fine. It's when you say a word. No, I just thought about it. And I was like, no, I don't yeah, know. What it no, means. it's all good. It's like just say one word over and over again, and then kind of like it's like what what the hell is this word meaning? I mean, so like public. Oh my god, yeah. So public, so public, fucking public, public, public. Be- beautiful, beautiful example. Um, beautiful. <laughs> nobody knows what the definition of 
fascism is anymore or yeah, communism for exactly. that matter. No one knows what either of those two Especially terms Especially fascism, because I hear more people being called fascist than communist. But yeah, communist is. Like- I think I think communist was was had the same problem, but like. More, during the cold yeah like the communism thing was right. fascism during the cold war during the yeah. red scares nowadays yeah. the way to insult someone isn't calling them a communist call them a fascist but like people don't realize what a fascist actually is it's so stupid or like nazi you know like um the thing i hate the most is that like people will call like first of all there's different forms of nationalism and there's different forms of fascism nazism is a specific form of fascism that is inherently racist so like yeah fascism is inherently racist. or no it's not fascism sorry nazism is inherently racist because it's rooted in yes. in, in dar- uh, social darwinism and, and these racial genetic concepts fascism on the other hand is not inherently racist um so like when you call but but, but then being racist doesn't mean you're a nazi either you know what i mean so being a fascist doesn't yes. mean you're a nazi being fascist doesn't mean you're racist being a nazi means you are racist but being racist yes. doesn't mean you're a Nazi. But not all racists are, fa- but not all racists are Nazis. Yeah, look at the but KKK. The KKK uh, were an offshoot of Confederate soldiers who formed yep. a paramilitary group. The Confederates were the opposite of Nazis. They were about small government and state rights. And and you know, um, granted, both the slave, uh, both the South and the Nazis probably would have wanted to enslave uh, ethnic minorities, but. Nazism was built around a strong central state. They would have never supported something like the South, which was, you know, each state uh, had a lot more, uh, a lot more, what do you call it, jurisdiction over their, the, their regional yeah. governance. That would never be allowed it may, in a Nazi It might have agreed on the racism, but that yeah, was yeah. probably the only thing. But that's what I mean, right? So Nazism is racist inherently, but racism yes. is not well, inherently yes, it, Nazi. It has to be because they organize their society off of the race. Exactly. but That's what Nazism is. Right, but there's different forms of racist political um, exactly theory. so there's nazis there's like the confederates the confederates i don't even know what they're you would i, I guess they're racist libertarians essentially <laughs> <laughs> that's an issue i mean yeah they were slaver yeah. libertarians yeah so, yeah because they were about small government but they wanted slaves so when people yep. call like all these ethno nationalists like nick fuentes or richard spencer or whatever they just instantly call them nazis it makes me laugh you know but they're not you could call them racist um, but that's yeah no they're not that's pretty accurate but they might, like they might turn out to be nazis but nothing they've said so far tells me they're no. nazi like even like technically i know that like you look at the alt-right a lot of them were nazis and like richard spencer when he was at his prime he was like doing the nazi salute and saying hail trump and all this shit and he was like saying party like as in 1933 but i think that was more to like shock people rather than him being an actual nazi he might be an actual nazi but the evidence yeah. that we had of him was he was racist. Absolutely. Yeah. He was an yeah, ethno-nationalist. Yeah. He was a white nationalist. But to call him a Nazi, he would have to be someone that supports a strong central government, that supports uh, a society where like every, every class is, is contributing to like this, this national identity. Whereas um, I, I don't know enough about Richard Spencer, but I would imagine that he really just cared about the racial elements. I don't think his actual policies were necessarily Nazi. He might have been fascist, Nazi-ist. for example, but I don't think he was a Nazi. And fascist, perhaps, but not yeah. necessarily Nazi. No, and Nick Jackson. Fuentes. Yeah. What's, up? What's our boy Jack's law about? I don't know. Um, and <laughs> if this was a game and you were trying to report them, to, the devs would just say it's working as intended. Yeah, I think they would. Yeah. You ever just look at someone and you see and say that it's just working as intended? Um yeah, no, I agree with that too, Dumpster Fire. We, oh yeah, you know, absolutely. We're surrounded it's, by NPCs and we gotta do something about it. I mean not, not just talk. like not, not just that we're surrounded by NPCs, but but it, it's Yo Dumpster, you wanna you wanna join on the Discord call uh, before we end the stream? You can talk to us for a few minutes. Good. Why not? I invited Jack's Law, but he didn't respond. And honestly, I don't even know if I want Jack's Law on the call. I don't know what he's gonna say. I don't know what he, I don't know what he's gonna you, say. But I'm happy to hear them out. I love you, Jack's Law, but I'm a little worried about adding you to a stream. I don't know if I trust you because you might say some. Crazy I'll hear shit. anyone out. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not like this man. I have nothing to lose. <laughs> well, no, but I have monetization to lose. I can't lose my monetization <laughs> if he starts saying some like, you know, exactly. Crazy shit. It's true, it's true, it's true. But just going back, but, um, like, I think I think Dumpster Fire and Jack's Law, right? It's yeah. A lot of this is. 
maybe not intentional ploys to confuse people. They're organic conspiracies, like we discussed. Or- organic, like we yeah. said that on Monday. Organic conspiracies exactly. to distract people. It just people. kind of comes about naturally. But really quick, just to finish my point with the whole like Nazi mm-hmm. thing. like People call people Nazis if they're racist. Yeah, they still are racist, but it doesn't make them a Nazi. People call someone fascist yep. because they're nationalist. Yeah, they might be a nationalist, but their form of nationalism could be like libertarian nationalism. And libertarianism and fascism are in like the opposite spectrum. Very, very of author- sure. Yeah, like fascism is authoritarian, libertarianism is the opposite of authoritarian. Um, so these buzzwords kind of get used a lot. Or like socialism and communism on the right. <laughs> right wing people, no. right-wing people will call left wing people. Um, Okay, no, we're not adding you, Jack's Law. I'll still talk to you on chat, but I'm not adding you. Not yet. We'll, we can call off we'll, stream. Um, yeah, we can call off stream in the yeah. Discord sometime. Yeah. Um, Vet you a little. Yeah, Dumpster Fire, you're definitely welcome. The Discord server, we just talk about philosophy and stuff and, you know, talk about politics. It's good stuff. You should definitely join Dumpster Fire or if you want to send me a personal email and talk about politics, I'm, I'm down anytime. I love talking about this sort of thing. But. Um, on the right, on the right wing side of things, a lot of times I'll hear right wing people call, call like left wing people, socialist or communist. I'm like, bro, yeah. they are neither. Of those not. Things. Like if you think you could call these like even Antifa, I'm sure some Antifa people are communist, but being Antifa doesn't make you a communist net right away. No. Like a lot of, a lot of the Antifa are actually like anarcho capitalists, for example, but they're just liberal in their social ideology. Right. Cause there's different things. There's there's authoritarianism and libertarianism. There's race racialism and there's multiculturalism or multi ethnicism on far corners. There's you know nationalism, globalism. There's all these different contending spectrums. But sorry if you lost. But there's you know there's all sorts of different ones. Uh, yeah, my I mean, father died I mean, and this girl. I've, I, as someone who's who had like a two year long argument with a with an anarcho communist. Who yeah, was so at one point like a Marxist? Yeah. The, the denominations under collectivism are insane. Oh yeah. Like you can be a communist and an anarchist. You can be a communist and completely authoritarian. Technically speaking, though, even within communism, it's meant to revert to like a sort of anarchist system. Like even Lenin said, and I don't, you know, buy this for a second in terms of practicality. But Lenin technically said, "We're going to first create an authoritarian authoritarian state, mm-hmm. and then we're going to create an anarchist state eventually once people have." you know, communism instilled in their, the, you know, in the zeitgeist of whatever, uh, yeah, that's what they all say, right? Yeah, that's what they say. Well, they don't all say that. <laughs> I don't think the Nazis said that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean no, but like, that's no, what I was the... being funny. I'm pretty sure the Nazis uh-huh. said they're going to create a, you know, a Reich and, you know, you know, enslave the Slavs and, and they were pretty ex- they were they, pretty you read, like Mein Kampf literally says wild. all the crazy shit he's gonna do, and nobody said it. Nobody did oh, anything. Nobody did anything. Don't give a fuck. His, his book was literally there, where he says, "I'm gonna invade Eastern Europe and enslave." Well, I don't know if he says exactly that he's gonna enslave the people, but he basically said they're gonna take the land. I use some fancy word like subjugate. Sure. Well, he did say that he stuff about mm-hmm. like um he said some pretty anti-Semitic stuff. That I, I gotta read. I gotta read. Like I haven't read Mein Kampf all the way through i've read i've tried to read it a few times I've never read any because like you know it's a fascinating like when i was 14 or 13 11 whatever i bought communist manifesto and i bought mein Kampf. i tried to read them both communist manifesto really easy to read so short mein Kampf is boring long well it's I've, it's the rants of of hitler yeah. from prison and he wasn't edited a by he was a speaker so like you're it's like he a was, reading speech it's just hard he was he was ranting to who the fuck Rudolf Hess. Yeah, His Rudolf Hess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first grammar Nazi. Yeah, literally. Like literally, literally the first grammar but, Nazi. But like Mein Kampf is so hard to read. So most of what I know about Mein Kampf is like other people who have read it and I read their summaries. But essentially Yeah, I've read like I've read some excerpts from both. Yeah. Um I mean it's still interesting to read yeah. because it's like you want to get into the mind of a of a guy like, you know, who 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 you know who achieved like such heights of human power, right? Like, that's fascinating. And especially how he achieved that power and what he intended to do with that power. Like, imagine what the planet would look like if if, if they somehow won. It would look completely different. It would be... In a, the entire all, cultural cultural landscape, ideological... Dude, everyone like, would be enslaved. Philosophical. They would literally enslave every single religious minority to a certain degree. And when I say enslave, I don't yeah. mean slavery like American slavery, but more like British colonialism, for example. Um uh 
one of the interesting rants I've read was the one by Elliot Rogers. Bro, Elliot Rogers is so lame. That guy could have, like, he was mad that he couldn't get laid. Like, he was a good looking guy. He just had such a horrible attitude. Here's the problem with like, who, and here's I don't the, know who Elliot Rogers he's is. He's the guy who shot up all those people in Santa Barbara. Oh, shit. Fuck. All right. I, I want to address that dumpster fire because I have some thoughts on it, which are really funny. But just to clarify what I'm finishing up with, like, he literally said what he was going to do, Hitler, in Mein Kampf, and nobody did anything about it. They gave him the Sudetenland. They gave him Czechoslovakia. They yeah, they just him, appeased his political aspirations. Yeah. Um, so crazy. So, like, literally, in Mein Kampf, he wrote everything he was going to do, and nobody did shit about it. So, to pe- for people to say, like, oh, I didn't see this coming. Like, it was right there. That's yeah, another sure. thing. He said it. Wait, how did I start talking about Mein Kampf? What was the original thing? I don't fucking Whereas we were talking um, about fascism, how people just call everyone racist and fascist and stuff. It emerged from there. I don't know, man. I don't know either. But anyway. No. Yeah. Um, the Elliot Rogers thing, which is funny. Like, dude, it's not that hard to talk to women. It's like just here's no. here's the problem. People are either too much of a dick or too nice. Now, most nice guys, quote unquote, are nice because they want to get laid. If you're nice to a woman yep. because you want to get laid, you're never gonna get laid. But if you're just nice to a woman just to be nice to her, they'll see that. Women can tell when you're being genuine or not. You should just be nice to people in general. You should never be nice to someone because you want something out of them. That's never going to work. If you're like, I was nice to this girl and, and she, I opened this, the door for this girl today. She didn't even suck my dick. Like that kind of attitude. Like it's an exaggeration. But just be nice to people. Treat people well and they will reciprocate. But you should just do it for the sake of doing, being nice. If you don't, and don't be afraid of rejection. If you're afraid of rejection, you're just going to be insecure. And I know because I was like low-key an incel in high school and, you know, had these kind of thoughts and then like you know i had a girlfriend eventually in my senior year of high school i'm like okay it's not that it's not that bad you know (laughs) like it's not that hard i just what you have to realize you can't expect things out of people you should be nice to people for the sake of being nice to them and don't be possessive just talk to people man yeah just talk to people you shouldn't like you have to have the attitude biggest piece of advice ever just just talk to people like they're people exactly here's a problem as, as as coming from someone who was kind of an incel before i would like fixate on a woman and like um the thought of like not like a girl i like the thought of not being her just like <laughs> destroyed me right and as i went through life and i got more mature i realized you can't think like that just like how are you supposed to meet the perfect girl if as soon as you meet a girl you like you just fixate on her you're not gonna meet the perfect girl you have to be open you have to make lots of friends and then you'll meet the perfect girl because if you don't, if you only if you if you pick three women for example that you like chances are they're not gonna be the perfect girl but if you pick, like, you know, if you're friends with lots of different women and then one of them you realize you have a great connection with, then boom, you're going to be more successful. So I think a problem with incels, because I had this problem before, was I would just fixate on one woman specifically, you know, whereas as I got older, I, you know, befriended more women. And then, you know, when I met my current uh, girlfriend, I, um, I basically, how do I explain it? Like, you know, I was like, okay. I, I, have any, I have no expectations, you know, and it turned out great. Um, I'm sure you can agree with this as well. So literally, I think the biggest problem with incels is that <laughs> they get fixed. Like, like, like I said before, you just, you just talk to people. Yeah. And it, when I say talk to people at, as people, mm-hmm. you, what, I, what that means is that you don't talk to them. Even if you're in a context that you're better, mm-hmm. you acknowledge... Your own limitations. You acknowledge their limitations. Yes, absolutely. And then act, actually, actually fucking listen to people. Yes. I think it's like as someone who was, who is very introverted, mm-hmm. but best social skill ever. Just fucking let people talk. Yeah. And then just ask questions mm-hmm. that are based on what they're saying. Right. And uh, people just explode with excitement. Yeah. Because everyone does. I mean, everyone likes to talk about themselves. To uh, other I people. don't know. I don't think everyone does. Yeah, I think everyone does. Almost everybody. I don't know. Because you could be right. Even if it's even if it's not like even if it's not talking no, about how talking great they are. Or my how, mom has never talked about herself they are. ever, dude. My mom does not talk about herself at all. It could just be talking about their life and like what's going dude, on. I'm talking about my mom. If my mom was gonna talk to anyone about herself, it'd be me. She never talks about mm-hmm. herself. Like mm-hmm. never. She's just like very quiet. Like she has a lot of friends and everything, but she does not talk there, about herself. There are always exceptions, right? Yeah, I'm just saying. I will, I will grant that there are always exceptions. Yeah. Uh, however, by and large, mm-hmm. if you just listen to people, they'll yeah. 
just talk and talk and talk. Yes, and no. some people you really literally just have to drill them with questions. Like they're you have to ask, yeah. but like they're not going to give you long response. You're gonna have to ask another question. Like if sure. I. Were, Anyway, I don't know. I'm 31, and my whole 20s was basically indulging my ego sex drive, and I had some good and some bad times, but not because I actually go got what I was trying for at the time. Yeah, generally, I, I kind of get that. Like, honestly, if you if you just go into a situation, like, here's what I found, right? If you talk to, like, five women with, you know, insecurity and with, like, the intention of, oh, I have to, I just have to, like, be with this one. I have to get her, you know, to sleep with me or whatever. Dude, you're probably going to get rejected by all five women. But if you go up to like 50 women with no intention, you're just being silly or not silly. You're just vibing and just like being yourself. You're probably going yeah. to connect with most I, of those women, like more than 50 every, of them. Every, every relationship I think I've been, mm-hmm. been in, yeah. be it romantic or, or just like physical, just sexual. Yeah. I've just, I stumbled into every single one. Like yeah. most of the accident. It, it, I just stumbled into them. Exactly. Cause, cause. With women, if you have to do most of the work, it's never going to work out. The only the only yeah. time it works with a woman is if she's equally invested or more invested than you are. You're never going to yeah. will your way into a woman's Pretty heart. Pretty much, you can never force your way into a woman's heart. I mean, that's I mean, not just in a consensual way, like obviously that way too. But I mean, you literally, it's impossible to get a girl to love you if if she's not. You know, you know what I mean? Like you can't you can't just trick someone into loving you like a woman. Like they have to. There has to be a connection that they have. Like, like I think with women, I think women can get a guy to fall in love with them because men are less selective, first of all. Um, yeah, we are. Like I, my first girlfriend I ever had, I didn't like her at first. She was just my friend, and but she liked me the entire time. And you know, I eventually, you know, Same. yeah, it was a similar, similar situation. Yeah. But I don't think that happens as often. I'm sure it still does happen, but it doesn't have as happen as often as men, because women don't like a desperate guy, first of all, right? Um, men don't mind a desperate girl, I think, because like sometimes it's cool to not be the chaser. Uh, but just, women, women don't like a desperate guy, so that you can never for you can never like somehow get a woman think, to like her. I think, I think Jack's all, like you, right? all pin puts in an, an important an important thing is you you need to be open open to change because there is yes. There's effectively no constants yeah. in your life or in anyone's life, and open to change, but don't don't uh, give in out of convenience. Don't, don't change make... out of convenience. Change because yes. you're trying to really get better, and that's a difficult yes. distinction to make sometimes. It is, yeah, especially in the moment. It's very difficult. Yeah, making those calculated decisions and those calculated um, we're just making those calculations. Yeah. You had this end of things so wholesome. Take that step back. Dude, I don't know. Stream became hella wholesome. It's great. It's only like dumpster fire and Jack's law, but like that's like we're making a good connection right now, guys. That's fine. I'm feeling the love. <laughs> First, like, I like talking to people. Yeah. Talk to people's great. That's why I'm here. Dude, we Talk gotta to get people. we gotta get more disc people to like actually join the disc like calls. We really should. Like seriously. Fun. Join the Discord and actually have a conversation. I'm gonna I'm gonna task you with vetting out Jack's law to make sure he's not crazy. Oh, <laughs> fine. Let's go, so uh, let's go. So. Sorry, work. Jackson, I love you, but yeah. you scare me a little bit. That's good. That's right. If you're a great man, you should scare people. Talk like with you sometime, bro. Yeah. Um, I hit, I'll hit, you're in the Discord. I'll hit you up. Yo, for real. But um, my aunt's actually watching. Right. My aunt's watching the stream right now. She said, I think your assessment yeah. of relationships is quite pragmatic and almost statistical in theory, and I agree with you. Thank you. I, I respect. My, shout out to my aunt, Nani. She's been married for like a shit long time. She met her husband nice. my aunt, her. in the army when she was like twenty hey. something, and she's like, I don't know, she's probably like hundred a hundred years old now. No, just kidding, just kidding. She's like, <laughs> she's like sixty, I think. Um, so she should know a thing or two. But yeah, thanks, dumpster fire. Uh, it was fun for me too. I guess that's our cue to wrap up. Even they're so. ready to go. <laughs> yeah, you missed the first two hours. Dumpster fire. How do you how do you get notified about this? Because I put notifications on Discord and I put notifications on. Uh, the community section so if you need to get if you need a way to get notified i check those two ways out it might, really it might just be that they just don't have their uh like youtube notifications on like i never yeah, have my uh, YouTube notifications on yeah me neither but anyway all right i guess we're gonna end the stream now um thank you yep. guys yeah of course jack's law it, it yeah it's always fun having you, you, guys stream, you always, you always text some fun stuff even if it's hard to understand sometimes and dumpster fire i've <laughs> um, seen you a couple times so it's good to have you here 
and thank shout out to my aunt nani i think she's been watching this um so yeah appreciate all you guys um and uh hopefully see you on the next stream we're going to be doing a podcast friday uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not gonna be a live stream maybe we'll do a live stream too afterwards for fun like a short one you know because the podcasts are only about an hour just a short like a uh, short discussion well, well look we've been live streaming for three hours so if we do a podcast for an hour that's like plenty of time to live stream we oh we should do an omega we should do an omega live stream oh my god Wait, I, twitch, I swear on twitch if we, if we do no because there might be dicks though it's understanding like, like i could keep i could probably keep going if we do it earlier if we start earlier i could probably do this for like hours do you want to you can stay over friday if you want uh, i got like no, two probably not. i'll probably go back to my girls all right, fine. For the night. I don't know. We'll fine. see. Well, you're gonna, are we going to head out after work? That you'll change and then we'll go? That's what I'm thinking on Friday. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, but I'm also like going, hmm. doing shit on Saturday. All right. I'm busy, fine. man. All right. Well, we'll have to make the most out of Friday. Anyway, um, thank you All guys right. for showing up. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. As always, this is the yeah. Warrior Philosopher, building foundations of the Warrior Philosophy. And we'll see you next time. Peace out, my brothers and sisters. Deuces. Adios. All right, cool. That was fun.